Part 7 Barriers to Entry and Fixed Costs of Living How Intellectual Property Impedes Competition Kevin A. Carson, 2009 any consideration of intellectual property rights must start from the understanding that such rights undermine genuine property rights and hence are illegitimate in terms of libertarian principle. Real tangible property rights result from natural scarcity and follow as a matter of course from the attempt to maintain occupancy of physical property that cannot be possessed by more than one person at a time. Intellectual property, on the other hand, creates artificial scarcity where it does not naturally exist and can only be enforced by invading real tangible property and preventing the owner from using it in ways that violate the supposed intellectual property rights of others. As Stefan Kinsella points out, had a particularly gifted Cro-Magnon man been able to patent the building of log cabins, his heirs today would be entitled to prevent us from building cabins on our own land with our own logs until we paid whatever tribute they demanded. The business model required by proprietary digital information is even more invasive of genuine property rights than was traditional copyright law. The digital copyright regime in force under the terms of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, and the TRIPS provision of the Uruguay Round of GATT is focused entirely on preventing one from using his own hard drive and other property as he sees fit. It is actually illegal, thanks to such legislation, to sell hardware capable of circumventing DRM or to publicize the codes enabling someone to circumvent it. As Cory Doctorow points out, it's funny that in the name of protecting intellectual property, big media companies are willing to do such violence to the idea of real property, arguing that since everything we own, from our t-shirts to our cars to our e-books, embodies someone's copyright, patent, and trademark, that we're basically just tenant farmers living on the land of our gracious masters who've seen fit to give us a lease on our homes. DRM prevents the easy transfer of content between platforms, even when it's simply a matter of the person who purchased a CD or DVD wanting to play it somewhere more convenient. And the DMCA legally prohibits circumventing such DRM, even when, again, the purchaser of the content simply wants to facilitate his own use on a wider and more convenient variety of platforms. The levels of invasiveness required by intellectual property in the digital age cannot be exaggerated. The intrusive DRM embedded in proprietary media and the draconian legislation criminalizing technical means of circumvention should make that clear. The logical tendency of the digital copyright regime was portrayed quite convincingly by Richard Stallman in a dystopian short story, The Right to Read. Just Google it, it's well worth your time. Corporations rely on increasingly authoritarian legislation to capture value from proprietary information. Johann Soderberg compares the way photocopiers were monitored in the old USSR to protect the power of elites in that country from the free flow of information to the way the means of digital reproduction are monitored in this country to protect corporate power. Privileged state-connected economic interests are becoming increasingly dependent on such controls, but unfortunately for them, such controls are becoming increasingly unenforceable thanks to BitTorrent, strong encryption, and proxy servers. The DCSS uprising, in which court injunctions against a code to hack DVD encryption met with the defiant publishing of the code on blogs, mirror sites, and even t-shirts, is a case in point. The unenforceability of intellectual property rights undermines the business model prevalent among a major share of privileged, state-connected firms. Obsolete Business Model In the old days, the immense value of physical assets was the primary structural support for corporate boundaries, and in particular for the control of corporate hierarchies over human capital and other intangible assets. The declining importance of physical assets relative to human capital has changed this. As human capital becomes the primary source of corporate equity, the old rationale for corporate institutional control is evaporating. In the information and entertainment industries, before the digital and internet revolutions, the initial outlay for entering the market was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or more.
The old electronic mass media, as Yokai Benkler put it, were typified by high-cost hubs and cheap, ubiquitous reception-only systems at the end. This led to a limited range of organizational models for production, those that could collect sufficient funds to set up a hub. The same was true of print periodicals, with the increasing cost of printing equipment from the mid-19th century on serving as the main entry barrier for organizing the hubs. Between 1835 and 1850, the typical startup cost of a newspaper increased from $500 to $100,000, or from roughly $10,000 to $2.38 million in 2005 dollars. The networked economy, in contrast, is distinguished by network architecture and the low cost of becoming a speaker. The central change that makes this possible is that the basic physical capital necessary to express and communicate human meaning is the connected personal computer. The desktop revolution and the Internet mean that the minimum capital outlay for entering most of the entertainment and information industry has fallen to a few thousand dollars, and the marginal cost of reproduction is zero. The networked environment, combined with endless varieties of cheap software for creating and editing content, makes it possible for the amateur to produce output of a quality once associated with giant publishing houses and recording companies. That is true of the software industry, the music industry, thanks to cheap equipment and software for high-quality recording and sound editing, desktop publishing, and to a certain extent even to film, as witnessed by affordable editing technology and the success of Sky Captain. Podcasting technology makes it possible to distribute radio and television programming at virtually no cost to anyone with a broadband connection. A network of amateur contributors have peer-produced an encyclopedia, Wikipedia, which Britannica sees as a rival. As Tom Coates put it, the gap between what can be accomplished at home and what can be accomplished in a work environment has narrowed dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. It's also true of news, with ever-expanding networks of amateurs and venues like indie media, alternative new operations like Robert Perry's and Greg Palast's, and Natives and American troops blogging news firsthand from Iraq, at the very same time the traditional broadcasting networks are shutting down. Agency Problems, Breakaway Firms this has profoundly weakened corporate hierarchies in the information and entertainment industries and created enormous agency problems as well. As human capital eclipses physical capital as the main source of corporate equity, it becomes increasingly feasible for the human capital assets to vote with their feet and take their skills elsewhere, forming breakaway firms and leaving their former employers as hollowed-out firms that own little more than the company name. Maurice Saatchi's walkout from the Saatchi & Saatchi Advertising Agency and the walkout of Solomon Brothers Traders responsible for 87% of the bond trading firm's profits are two good examples. As organization theory writer Luigi Zingales put it, if we take the standpoint that the boundary of the firm is the point up to which top management has the ability to exercise power, the group was not an integral part of Salomon. It merely rented space, Salomon's name, and capital, and turned over some share of its profits as rent. David Pachico remarked on breakaway firms in the tech industry back in the 1990s when it was barely underway. Old firms act as embryos for new firms. If a worker or group of workers is not satisfied with the existing firm, each has a skill which he or she controls and can leave the firm with those skills and establish a new one. In the information age, it is becoming more evident that a boss cannot control the workers as one did in the days when the assembly line was dominant. People cannot be treated as workhorses any longer, for the value of the production process is becoming increasingly embodied in the intellectual skills of the worker. This poses a new threat to the traditional firm if it denies participatory organization. The appearance of breakaway computer firms leads one to question the extent to which our existing system of property rights and ideas and information actually protects bosses and in other industries against the countervailing power of workers. Perhaps our current system of patents, copyrights, and other intellectual property rights not only impedes competition and fosters monopoly, as some Austrians argue. Intellectual property rights may also reduce the likelihood of breakaway firms in general and discourage the shift to more participatory cooperative formats.
In this environment, the only thing standing between the old information and media dinosaurs and their total collapse is their so-called intellectual property rights, at least to the extent that they're still enforceable. Ownership of intellectual property becomes the new basis for the power of institutional hierarchies and the primary buttress for corporate boundaries. The increasing prevalence and imploding cost of small-scale distributed production machinery and the rise of crowdsourced distributed means of aggregating capital from small donors means that physical production is governed by the same phenomenon to a considerable extent. Without intellectual property, in any industry where the basic production equipment is widely affordable and bottom-up networking renders management obsolete, it is likely that self-managed cooperative production will replace the old managerial hierarchies. The network revolution, if its full potential is realized, as James Bennett put it in the appropriately titled article The End of Capitalism and the Triumph of the Market Economy, will lead to substantial redistribution of power and money from the 20th century industrial producers of information, culture, and communications, like Hollywood, the recording industry, and perhaps the broadcasters and some of the telecommunications giants, to a combination of widely diffuse populations around the globe and the market actors that will build the tools that make this population better able to produce its own information environment rather than buying it ready-made. Paying for the name Another effect of the shift in importance from tangible to intangible assets is that a growing portion of product prices consists of embedded rents on intellectual property and other artificial property rights rather than the material costs of production. Tom Peters, in the Tom Peters Seminar, was fond of gushing about the increasing portion of product value made up of ephemera and intellect, i.e. the amount of final price consisting of tribute to the owners of intellectual property, rather than labor and material costs. To quote Michael Perlman, the so-called weightless economy has more to do with the legislated powers of intellectual property that the government granted to powerful corporations. For example, companies such as Nike, Microsoft, and Pfizer sell stuff that has high value relative to its weight only because their intellectual property rights insulate them from competition. But intellectual property, as we have already seen, is becoming increasingly unenforceable. As a result, the ownership of proprietary content is becoming increasingly untenable as a basis for corporate institutional power, and we can expect the portion of commodity price resulting from embedded rents on artificial property rights to implode. Intellectual property also serves as a bulwark for planned obsolescence and high overhead production. A major component of the business model that prevails under existing corporate capitalism is the offer of platforms below cost coupled with the sale of patented or copyrighted spare parts, accessories, etc. at an enormous markup. So one buys a cell phone for little or nothing with the contractual obligation to use only a specified service package for so many years. One buys a fairly cheap printer which uses enormously expensive ink cartridges. One buys a cheap glucometer with glucose testing strips that cost $100 a box. And to hack one's phone to use a different service plan or to manufacture generic ink cartridges or glucose testing strips in competition with the proprietary version is illegal. As it is now, appliances are generally designed to thwart repair. When the repairman tells you it would cost more than it's worth to repair your washing machine, he's telling the truth. But that state of affairs reflects a deliberate design. The machine could have been designed on a modular basis so that the defective part might have been cheaply and easily replaced. And if the manufacturer were subject to unfettered competition, the normal market incentive would be to do so. Absent legal constraints, it would be profitable to offer competing generic replacements and accessories for other firms' platforms. And in the face of such competition, there would be strong pressure toward modular product designs that were amenable to repair and interoperable with the modular components and accessories of other companies' platforms. Absent the legal constraints of patents, an appliance designed to thwart ease of repair through incompatibility with other companies' platforms would suffer a competitive disadvantage. Patents historically promoted the stable control of markets by oligopoly firms through the control, exchange, and pooling of patents.
According to David Noble, two essentially new science-based industries, those that grew out of the soil of scientific rather than traditional craft knowledge, emerged in the late 19th century, the electrical and chemical industries. In the electric industry, General Electric had its origins first in a merger between Edison Electric, which controlled all of Edison's electrical patents, and the Sprague Electric Railway and Motor Company, and then in an 1892 merger between Edison General Electric and Thomas Houston, both of them motivated primarily by patent considerations. From the 1890s on, the electrical industry was dominated by two large firms, GE and Westinghouse, both of which owed their market shares largely to patent control. By 1896, the litigation cost from some 300 pending patent suits was enormous, and the two companies agreed to form a joint board of patent control. General Electric and Westinghouse pooled their patents, with GE handling 62.5% of the combined business. The structure of the telephone industry had similar origins, with the Bell Patent Association forming the nucleus of the first Bell Industrial Organization and eventually of AT&T. The National Bell Telephone Company from the 1880s on fought vigorously to occupy the field, in the words of General Manager Theodore N. Vail, through patent control. AT&T, anticipating the expiration of its original patents, had surrounded the business with all the auxiliary protection that was possible. By the time the FCC was formed in 1935, the Bell system had acquired patents to some of the most important inventions in telephony and radio, and, through various radio patent pool agreements in the 1920s, had effectively consolidated its position relative to the other giants in the industry. The American chemical industry, in its modern form, was made possible by the Justice Department's seizure of German chemical patents in World War I. More generally, intellectual property is an effective tool for cartelizing markets in industry at large. They were used in the automobile and steel industries, among others, according to Noble. In a 1906 article, mechanical engineer and patent lawyer Edwin Prindle described patents as the best and most effective means of controlling competition. And unlike purely private cartels, which tend toward defection and instability, patent control cartels, being based on a state-granted privilege, carry a credible and effective punishment for defection. At the global level, intellectual property plays the same protectionist role for transnational corporations that tariffs performed in the old national economies. It's hardly coincidental that the dominant industrial sectors in the global corporate economy are all heavily dependent on intellectual property, software, entertainment, biotech, pharmaceuticals, and electronics. And the central focus of the neoliberal system, which has been falsely identified with free trade and free markets, is on strengthening the legal intellectual property regime as the primary source of profits. Trademarks and other forms of intellectual property are central to what Naomi Klein calls the Nike model, by which TNCs outsource actual production to independently owned job shops while retaining control of finance, marketing, and IP. Absent strong IP law, independent job shops could treat corporate headquarters and produce knockoffs of identical quality without the enormous brand name markup. Patents are also used on a global scale to lock transnational manufacturing corporations into a permanent monopoly on productive technology. The central motivation in the GATT intellectual property regime is to permanently lock in the collective monopoly of advanced production technology by transnational corporations and relegate third-world countries to supplying raw materials and sweatshop labor. It would, as the Third World Network's Martin Kor Kok Peng writes, effectively prevent the diffusion of technology to the third world. Intellectual property is central to the so-called cognitive capitalism model. Under that model, corporations rely on increasingly authoritarian government legislation to capture value from proprietary information. Johann Soderberg compares the way photocopiers were monitored in the old USSR to protect the power of elites in that country to the way the means of digital reproduction are monitored in this country to protect corporate power. Today, intellectual property serves as a structural support for corporate boundaries at a time when the imploding cost of production technology has undermined control of physical capital as their primary justification.
In this environment, the only thing standing between the old information and media dinosaurs and their total collapse is their so-called intellectual property rights, at least to the extent they're still enforceable. Ownership of intellectual property becomes the new basis for the power of institutional hierarchies and the primary structural bulwark for corporate boundaries. Drawing to a close. But to repeat, the good news is that, both in the domestic and global economies, this business model is doomed. The shift from physical to human capital as the primary source of productive capacity in so many industries, along with the imploding price and widespread dispersion of ownership of capital equipment, means that corporate employers are increasingly hollowed out and only maintain control over the physical production process through legal fictions. When so much of actual physical production is outsourced to the independent small shop, whether it be a Chinese sweatshop, a flexible manufacturing firm in Emilia Romagna, or a member of GM's supplier network, the corporation becomes a redundant node that can be bypassed. As blogger David Pollard described it, from the perspective of a future historian in 2015. The expensive outsourcers quickly found themselves unnecessary middlemen. The large corporations, having shed everything they thought was non-core competency, learned to their chagrin that in the connected information economy, the value of their core competency was much less than the inflated value of their stock, and they have lost much of their market share to new federations of small entrepreneurial businesses. For all the harm it does, intellectual property is not really even necessary as an incentive for innovation. Industrial analyst F. M. Scherer argued that in the 1990s, based on a survey of 91 companies, that some 86 percent of all process and product innovations would have been developed from the necessity of remaining competitive, the desire for efficient production, and the desire to expand and diversify their sales. And copyright is no more necessary for artistic creation than patents are necessary for invention. There are many businesses in the open source world that manage to make money from auxiliary services, even though their content itself is not proprietary. For example, Red Hat makes money off open source Linux software by customizing the software and offering specialized customer support. Fish has actively encouraged fans to share its music free of charge, while making money off of live performances and concessions. Since IP is not necessary to encourage innovation, this means its main practical effect is to cause economic inefficiency by levying a monopoly charge on the use of existing technology. In any case, whether or not intellectual property is necessary to profit from certain forms of economic activity should be beside the point for principled libertarians. That's the same argument used by protectionists. Certain businesses would be unprofitable if they weren't protected by tariffs, but no one has a right to profit at someone else's expense through the use of force. In particular, no one has the right to make a profit by using the state to prevent others from doing as they please with their own pen and paper, hard drives, or CDs. A business model that isn't profitable without government intervention should fail. The American Land Question, Joseph R. Stromberg, 2009. In 1934, in the depths of the Great Depression, Southern agrarian and historian Frank Owsley called for an American land reform. He suggested that unemployed or underemployed families be staked to a homestead, even subsidized to remain on the land and produce. Footnote: Owsley, as paraphrased by Clyde N. Wilson in *Defending Dixie: Essays in Southern History and Culture*, Columbia, South Carolina. Foundation for American Education, 2006, page 337. This proposal was not really all that shocking. Such a program would have been consistent enough with the advertised purpose of certain phases of American land policy from 1776 on. American governments handed out land, however acquired, for over a century to veterans, settlers, land speculators, railroads, timber corporations, mining companies, and other parties. I'll give you three guesses which groups made out the best. Governments did so as a source of revenue, for geostrategic reasons, to win favor with voters, or to reward a small class of typically American operators who flat out deserve to be rich.
In a new revolutionary and republican society, there was of course much talk about widespread property as the bulwark of republican freedom. But the talk was so general that federalists and republicans could share it, while leaving themselves plenty of room in which to create a small class of owners of a disproportionate amount of the public domain. Overall, from the founding land speculators down to 1893, when the frontier allegedly ran out, American land policy resembled in both theory and practice the kind of privatization we see under mercantilist Republican administrations. One landmark in the process was Johnson and Graham's lessee versus William McIntosh, 1823. Here, Chief Justice John Marshall undertook to write a long essay on the received theory of how property previously stolen by European kings or their agents is best conveyed. As was his wont, Marshall proved entirely too much in his clear case of Albert J. Knox's copper riveting of narrowly focused property rights as we could want. Footnote. For international law and property stolen overseas, see Antony Angie, Finding the Peripheries, Sovereignty and Colonialism in 19th Century International Law, Harvard International Law Journal, 40, Winter 1999, pages 1 to 71. On Indian title, see Carl Watner, Libertarians and Indians, Proprietary Justice and Aboriginal Land Rights. Journal of Libertarian Studies, 7, Spring 1983, pages 147 to 156. Ronald Takaki, Iron Cages, Race and Culture in 19th Century America, New York, OUP 1990-1979, Chapter 4, Beyond Primitive Accumulation. Joseph R. Stromberg, Albert J. Nock and Alternative History, The Freeman Ideas on Liberty, 58.9, November 2008, pages 32 to 38. Southern agrarian Andrew Little noted that from the settler's point of view, the whole frontier process represented an attempt to get away from would-be aristocrats and other aspiring land monopolists. Consistent Republican ideologists like Thomas Skidmore and George H. Evans agitated from the 1820s into the 1840s in favor of giving homesteaders first claim on the territories. Generally speaking, other claimants prevailed while the politics of slavery and anti-slavery further complicated the matter. In the bigger picture, the Homestead Act of 1862 was the exception rather than the rule, as Paul W. Gates showed in a noteworthy 1936 paper. Footnote, Andrew Little, The Backwoods Progression, From Eden to Babylon, The Social and Political Essays of Andrew Nelson Little, edited by M. E. Bradford, Washington, D.C., Gateway Regnery, 1990, pages 77 to 94. On Skidmore and Evans, see William Appleman Williams, The Roots of the Modern American Empire, New York, Random, 1969, page 75. Paul W. Gates, The Homestead Law in an Incongruous Land System, American Historical Review, 41, July 1936, pages 652 to 681. Roy M. Robbins, Our Landed Heritage, Lincoln, University of Nebraska Press, 1942. Arthur A. Eckrich, Jr., The Decline of American Liberalism, New York, Athenaeum, 1969, Chapter 10, Preemption, Exploitation, Progress. I cannot discuss here what an ideal policy based on mixing one's labor with resources might have looked like. Suffice it to say that sales of thousands and tens of thousands of acres to individuals, land companies, and corporations were not especially consistent with any genuine Republican ideal. The disappearance of most of the best land in California into the hands of a half-dozen individuals in a few decades comes to mind. Footnote Stuart H. Holbrook, The Age of the Moguls, Garden City, New York, Doubleday, 1954, pages 118 to 128. But large-scale buyers had mixed their money with federal land officers, and that no doubt counts for something. Meanwhile, the judiciary, state and federal, busily remodeled the common law and shifted the burdens of industrialization onto third parties, extensively modifying the older law of nuisance. Harry Scheiber finds that law was often, if not to say usually, mobilized to provide effective subsidies and immunities to heavily capitalized special interests under either instrumentalist or formalist doctrine. Even existing doctrines of public rights and eminent domain came to serve business interests.
Finally, federal judges' discovery in the 1880s of corporate personhood in the 14th Amendment perfected the Federalist Party's original mercantilist program. Footnote, Harry N. Scheiber, Regulation, Property Rights, and Definition of the Market, Law and the American Economy. Journal of Economic History, 41, March 1981, pages 103 to 109. On corporate personhood, see Walter Prescott Webb, Divided We Stand, The Crisis of a Frontierless Democracy, Westport, Connecticut, Hyperion, 1985, 1944, pages 32 to 48. All these changes importantly influenced just who would benefit from the American state system of land tenure, to use Knox's phrase, and its attendant modes of preemption and exploitation. Land and Independence Many writers have seen a special relationship between land ownership and personal independence. And here we hit on what is perhaps the truest insight of Republican theory, one taken up by many classical liberals. Briefly, this holds that a broad middle class of property owners is essential to the maintenance of free societies. The point is as old as Aristotle. On the negative side, in decrying the social effects of England's fabled land monopoly, radical liberals like Percy Bysshe Shelley, Thomas Paine, Thomas Hodgkin, and John Bright implicitly affirmed the Republican axiom. A typical 19th century American self-help book aimed at young men did not say, get a job working for wages within an increasingly intricate division of labor so as to enjoy a greater variety of consumer goods. Instead, it said, get yourself a competency, a vision fraught with Republican implications suitably modernized. Working for wages, if one did it at all, was a temporary stage to be endured while learning a skill or trade, and abandoned later in favor of real or potential independence. This independence, derided in our time as illusory, left one free within limits, not just from state interference, but also from 19th century employers. And if independence is illusory in our time, it is at least partly because the political activities of well-connected elites long since removed the preconditions of independence deliberately and systematically. One key, but not the only one, to this much sought after independence was access to land, a theme taken up by Catholic writers Hilaire Belloc and G. K. Chesterton in early 20th century England. Sociologist Robert Nisbet commented that never, after reading Belloc, did he imagine that there could be genuine individual liberty apart from individual ownership of property. In any case, as historian Christopher Lash put it, Americans took it as axiomatic that freedom had to rest on the broad distribution of property ownership. Footnote, Robert Nisbet, Introduction, The Servile State, by Hilaire Belloc, Indianapolis, Liberty Fund, 1977, page 14. Christopher Lash, The True and Only Heaven, New York, Norton, 1991, page 204. Perhaps Americans were wrong to believe such a thing, but let us examine the matter a bit more. This American axiom receives support from those political economists who believe that the land-labor ratio importantly determines social structure. Edward Gibbon Wakefield somewhat gave the game away in the 1830s by opposing easy access to land in Australia, lest potential wage earners try for self-sufficiency before spending enough years working for others. Marx chided Wakefield for letting this bourgeois secret out, and was in turn chided by Franz Oppenheimer, Achille Loria, and Nock for not learning the right lesson from Wakefield's recommendations on rigging the market. Footnote. Karl Marx, Capital, New York, International, 1967, 1887, 1, Chapter 33. The Modern Theory of Colonization. Franz Oppenheimer, A Postmortem on Cambridge Economics, American Journal of Economics and Sociology, 3, October 1943, pages 121 to 122. Franz Oppenheimer, The Gospel of Freedom, American Journal of Economics and Sociology, 7, April 1948, page 363. H. J. Nybor argued, 1900, that where resources are open, few will work for big enterprises, and the latter will, if they can, institute some form of slavery. F. Z. Domar writes, 1970, that one never finds free land, free peasants, and non-working owners together, 
Why? Because where political leverage allows, aspiring lords and literal rent seekers will eliminate the free land, the free peasants, or both. Footnote H. J. Nybor, Slavery as an Industrial System, The Hague, Niehoff, 1900, pages 387 to 391. F. Z. D. Domar, The Causes of Slavery and Serfdom, A Hypothesis, Journal of Economic History, 30, March 1970, pages 18 to 32. Colonial Policies With this theorem in view, let us survey some colonial evidence. Enterprisers in colonies have always wanted regular supplies of cheap labor for their projects. Although there is no evidence in favor of a right to such thing, these prospective employers were never discouraged. Aided by colonial administrators with the same assumptions, they gradually overcame native economic independence. Land was the key, and neither the colonizers nor the natives doubted it. No matter how hard natives worked on their holdings, colonialists decried their idleness and their uncivilized failure to work for wages. We may therefore give the overworked English enclosures time off for now and look at some other cases. Footnote, but see William Lazenick, Karl Marx and Enclosures in England, Review of Radical Political Economics, 6, 1974, pages 1 to 59. Consider the Japanese colonial administrator in Okinawa, who complained in 1899 that the typical Okinawan held land and therefore had low expenses and few wants. For these reasons, the natives saw no need to undertake any other business, nor to save money. Since native lands were held informally, they could not be capitalized. Such people and properties did little for the great cause of development, and shortly the Japanese government denounced Okinawan's customary arrangements as feudal and set out to modernize the island. American occupation later perfected this anti-agrarian revolution. Footnote, Mark Selden, Okinawa and American Security Imperialism, Remaking Asia, Essays on the American Uses of Power, Edited by Selden, New York, Pantheon, 1974, pages 279 to 302. Doubtless, however, much employment was created in the post-World War II Okinawan service economy dominated by the U.S. military. Turning to English colonies in the Caribbean and Africa, we find comparable phenomena. England abolished slavery in the colonies in the 1830s, never mind that, as historian Eric Foner comments, through a regressive tax system the British working classes paid the bill for abolition. By this time, English policymakers had embraced Adam Smith's view that positive incentives motivated labor better than fear of starvation or draconian punishments did. But an ocean made all the difference, Foner observes, and new peasantries made up of former slaves were seen in London, as in the Caribbean, as a threat not simply to the economic well-being of the islands, but to civilization itself. John Stuart Mill's famous defense of peasant proprietors did not extend to the blacks of the Caribbean. Their desire to escape plantation labor and acquire land was perceived as encourageable idleness. Footnote, Eric Foner, Nothing But Freedom, Emancipation, and Its Legacy. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Louisiana State University Press, 1983, pages 14, 28, and 30. This last point has been misunderstood. It is quite separate from Mill's well-documented defense of the rights of black Jamaicans as subjects of the crown after the colonial governor Edward Eyer visited savage reprisal on alleged rebels in 1865. Mill did not, however, defend the rights of blacks in the colonies as a class of free peasant farmers. He expected them to work for wages or, at best, set themselves up as petty shopkeepers. Footnote. See Bart Schultz, Mill and Sidgwick, Imperialism and Racism. Utilitas, 19, 2007, pages 127 to 128, as well as the sources cited by Foner on the point, H.J. Perkin, Land Reform and Class Conflict in Victorian Britain, The Victorians and Social Protest, edited by J. Butt and I.F. Clark, Hamden, Connecticut, Archon, 1973, pages 177 to 217, and Clive J. Dewey, The Rehabilitation of the Peasant Proprietor in Nineteenth-Century Economic Thought, History of Political Economy, 6, 1974, pages 17 to 47.
On Mill's defense of black Jamaicans' legal rights, see Bernard Semmel, Democracy vs. Empire, The Jamaica Riots of 1865, and The Governor Iyer Controversy. Garden City, New York, Anchor, 1969. And so Britain's former slave colonies put vagrancy and other laws to work and crafted taxes aimed at restricting the freedmen's access to land. As Foner puts it, taxation has always been the state's weapon of last resort in the effort to promote market relations within peasant societies. That is, to force people into markets in which they were not eager to participate. In Kenya, the problem was one of dispossessing a peasantry with a pre-existing stake in the soil, but colonial legislation proved up to the task. Foner concludes that in Britain's Caribbean and African colonies, the free market was conspicuous by its absence, its workings restricted as far as possible in the interest of the well-off and powerful. Footnote, Foner, page 25, 31-32 and 37. Historian Colin Bundy has studied the economic rise and political economic fall of a class of independent African farmers in the Eastern Cape Colony and other parts of South Africa. Various Cape Location Acts, 1869, 1876, and 1884, sought to lessen the number of idle squatters, i.e. rent-paying tenants economically active on their own behalf, on white-owned lands. Such peasant farming conferred a degree of economic independence, an ability to withhold, if he so preferred, his labor from white landowners or other employers. Further, both the farmer and the mine owner perceived the need to apply extra economic pressures to break down the peasant's independence, increase his wants, and to induce him to part more abundantly with his labor, but at no increased price. In their view, Africans had no right to continue as self-sufficient and independent farmers if this conflicted with white interests. Footnote, Colin Bundy, The Rise and Fall of South African Peasantry. London, Heinemann, 1979, pages 78, 91, and 115. Bundy observes that social engineering on this scale took time and effort, but the incentives were powerful. By way of a one-man, one-lot rule under the Glen Gray Act of 1894, legislators sought to keep African farming within certain acceptable bounds. Here, finally, was a use for John Locke's famous proviso about leaving enough resources for others. Evictions increased after the Anglo-Boer War, 1899-1903. Rents rose, enclosure defenders take note, and former tenants stayed on as laborers. Tax pressure on African farmers increased. This employer's offensive from 1890 to 1913 ended successfully in the South African Natives Land Act of 1913, which effectively outlawed the practices under which a particular African peasantry had shown much success. Footnote, Bundy, pages 134 to 135, 137. One supposes, in standard libertarian fashion, that agricultural employment increased thereafter along with land values, but that was the whole point, to proletarianize independent peasants by leaving them no option but to work for wages for Boers and Brits on farms, in mines, and elsewhere. Whether more employment was good in itself seems unclear. We can at least impute the outcome back to specific political intentions and levers. So much for the colonies, then, and all this without even mentioning the two greatest monuments to England's defense of free markets, Ireland and India. Telescopic Land Reform Colonial bureaucrats and employers saw a definite connection between small-scale land ownership and independence, and resolved to cut that independence short. By now we begin to see that the subsidy of history, to use Kevin Carson's useful term, has been very large indeed. Footnote. Kevin Carson, The Subsidy of History, The Freeman Ideas on Liberty, 58.5, June 2008, pages 33 to 38. A number of libertarians have understood the problem at hand in pretty much these terms. They have tended, however, to dwell on instances far away from our own shores, writing about land reform in Latin America, South Africa, Asia, and other places. In the mid-1970s, Murray Rothbard, Roy Childs, and others addressed the matter. 
Rothbard wrote that free market economists go to Asia and Latin America and urge the people to adopt the free market and private property rights, while ignoring the suppression of the genuine private property of the peasants by the exactions of quasi-feudal landlords. In this vacuum, only the local communists appeared to support the peasants' struggle for their property, and so libertarians allowed themselves to become supporters of feudal landlords and land monopolists in the name of private property. Footnote, Murray Rothbard, Justice and Property Right. Innovator, January 1965, pages 10 to 11. Decades earlier, that very conservative German liberal economist Wilhelm Röpke wrote that German history would have gone better had Prussia undergone a radical agrarian reform, breaking up the great estates and putting peasant farms in their place. He adds, influential social democratic leaders opposed the transformation of the great estates in Prussia into peasant holdings as a retrograde step. Ropk called for freeing Germany from agrarian and industrial feudalism and the ills of proletarization, of concentration and over-organization of the agglomeration of individual power and the destruction of the individuality of labor. In his view, the typical proletarianized worker or clerk wanted a small house of his own with a garden and a goat shed, an undisturbed family life without training courses, mass meetings, processions and political flag days, dignity and pleasure in his work, an independent if modest existence. Footnote, Wilhelm Röpk, The Solution of the German Problem, New York, Putnam's, 1946. Pages 184, 186, and 203 to 204. Why go abroad? For enclosure-like pressures on small holders closer to home, we need look no farther than states like Kentucky, where courts vigorously enforced the full feudal rigor of the broad-form deed, thereby ensuring the strip mining of many a mountaineer out of productive existence down to the early 1990s. Footnote, James Branscombe, Paradise Lost, Southern Exposure, Summer to Fall, 1973, pages 29 to 41, and John Gaventa, In Appalachia, Property is Theft, Southern Exposure, Summer to Fall, 1973, pages 42 to 52. With the system so long stacked in favor of big landholders and bankers, well subsidized by history, one begins to understand the popularity of those New Deal programs that promoted individual home ownership. Economist Michael Perlman has confirmed a direct relationship between rural labor without independent means of support and the applied politics of English classical economists. Footnote Michael Perlman, The Invention of Capitalism, Classical Political Economy, and the Secret History of Primitive Accumulation. Duke, North Carolina, Duke University Press, 2000, pages 1 through 12, Introduction, Dark Designs. The latter preached a great gospel of work, mainly for others who ought to be doing this work. Except for a narrowing class of dissenting Protestant factory owners, those most vigorously espousing this gospel were not themselves noted for doing a lot of work. Together, however, owners and economists said in effect, work for us, join the armed forces, or emigrate, ye doughty Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Scots. And emigrate they did, leaving us with an American folk wisdom in which old times in England, Scotland, and Ireland were not that great. This folk memory may have at least as much heuristic value as latter-day econometric claims that everyone became better off in the new division of labor. And so we return to Henry George's problem. How did Americans manage as a society to seize so much land, incur whatever moral guilt goes with the seizures, and then not bloody have any of it? The chief mechanism was precisely the political means to wealth that Oppenheimer and Nock analyzed. Footnote. See Stromberg, Nock. The reason the phrase robber barons struck the right note is that there were such individuals. California was a laboratory case, as George well knew, of the successful primitive accumulation of land by a microscopically small class of state-made men. As with ontogeny and phylogeny, Western accumulation recapitulated Eastern accumulation.
From such causes arose the famous end of the frontier circa 1893, but open land did not so much disappear naturally as succumb to preemption. And then, with perfect timing, the conservation movement put enormous quantities of land beyond the reach of actual settlers. As for those Americans who currently own property, they typically own it after 20 or more years of bank payments. Is land so genuinely scarce that a bank must always be in the middle? This remains our central question. Certainly, 19th century allocations played a lasting role, and later political interventions added to concentrated property ownership. And what of the promotion of easy home ownership in recent years? Is it the product of, one, the widespread delusion in the wake of Lyndon Johnson's and Richard Nixon's inflationary financing of the Vietnam War that real estate constitutes the ultimate inflation hedge, and two, the specific dynamics of the expansionist fractional reserve banking under new rules, deregulation, increasing moral hazards for bankers. There is also the unhappy fact of property taxes, our chief surviving feudal due. Fail to pay those, and the state enrolls a new owner on your former property. This reduces somewhat the fact of private property and land. Independence, Republicanism, and Liberty some classical liberals and libertarians downgrade personal independence. Better to participate in the going order and enjoy a wider array of comforts, they say. But socialists and corporate liberals can play the same game, and have for over a century. It seems to me that those libertarians who join in this refrain rather willfully misconstrue a very simple point. They hail the joys of the division of labor, the higher degree of civilization, that is, more stuff, to be gained from dependence, interdependence, and sundry trickles of income and utility down and up. But already in 1936, Southern agrarian John Crow Ransom noticed a flaw in this reasoning, writing, Income is not enough, and the distribution of income is not enough. If those blessings sufficed, we might as well come to collectivism at once, for that is probably the quickest way to get them. Footnote, John Crow Ransom, The South is a Bulwark, 1936, in Jack Salzman and Barry Wallenstein Editors, Year of Protest, New York, Pegasus, 1967, page 268. If greater choice among consumer goods makes up for lost independence, then the case for socialism, or X, would be clinched, provided socialism, or X, could deliver the economic goods, where X stands for any political ideology offering us the same stuff independence trade-off. I doubt we are necessarily better off merely because of employment. We need to know more, including why particular sets of choices exist in the first place. Back in the 60s, Selective Service used to channel us into the right occupations by threatening to draft us. Given the parameters, our choices were free. If it's that easy, then we are always free, no matter what the historical and institutional constraints. Similarly, to hell or cannot was a choice, and never mind that Oliver Cromwell and his army arbitrarily created this particular prisoner's dilemma. But perhaps I have leapt from choices among goods to choices between ways of life. Why? Let us look into this. What if proletarianization is not the ideal form of human life? What if a complex division of labor is merely useful or convenient, but not a moral imperative? What if most of us are hirelings, well-paid or otherwise, and then we learn what that status amounts to? The post-Marxist socialist André Gors writes, Capitalism owes its political stability to the fact that, in return for the dispossession and growing constraints experienced at work, individuals enjoy the possibility of building an apparently growing sphere of individual autonomy outside of work. Footnote, André Gors, Farewell to the Working Class, Boston, South End, 1982, page 80. Our interest here is the autonomy mentioned, which sounds like a near cousin of independence. The sentiment seems sound enough, and the partial convergence of Ropk and Gores is eye-opening. Now, in the view of Quentin Skinner, a modern Republican theorist of note, unfreedom arises both from direct forcible coercion and from institutional arrangements that make people dependent, since the latter always contain the possibility, realized or not, of arbitrary interference and coercion. Such discussions usually center on the form of state. Utilitarian liberals like Henry Sidgwick did not care about forms. 
If the sublime port, Tsar, or King of England leaves us substantially alone, we are free, and that is that. In Skinner's view, if these worthies can on their own motion change their policy of leaving us alone, we are not free, no matter what they are doing right now. Freedom requires that we not be menaced by latent unknown powers. Footnote. Quinton Skinner, Liberty Before Liberalism, Cambridge, UK, CUP, 1998, pages 68 to 72, 96 to 99. Freedom in this sense is liberty, a shared civic or public good. Like many real public goods, it is not provided by the state. Indeed, the state may be its chief enemy. Law and settled custom may provide this public good, and consumer goods, the people's pottage, do not compensate for abandoning such an order where it exists. Today, people often work long hours to buy some independence. In another time, they began with some independence and then chose how hard to work. Now we see perhaps the difference between choices among economic goods and past choices between systems structuring our choices. Widespread land ownership long supported a kind of liberal Republican independence. Perhaps we should re-examine the nexus and ask ourselves how, in Donald Davidson's words, we let the freehold pass, and whether that was really for the best. English Enclosures and Soviet Collectivization Two Instances of an Anti-Peasant Mode of Development Joseph R. Stromberg, 1995 1. Introduction. Land Monopoly as an Historical Perennial The control of major material and human factors of production by small, articulated minorities has been characteristic of civilized, state, societies. Of the four factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability, it is probably the control of land that has been of the greatest historical consequence, especially for pre-industrial societies. In the West, land monopoly has been intimately associated with feudalism in a political-economic sense. Footnote. In Europe, Germanic conquest of the Roman Empire's western provinces set the stage for feudalism in both the political, military, and economic meanings of the term. Certain features of this original feudalism persisted in two succeeding social formations. See Alexander Rousteau, Freedom and Domination. Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1980, and Arno Mayer, The Persistence of the Old Regime, New York, Pantheon, 1981. Critics as far apart ideologically as Karl Marx and the liberal Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises have stressed the role of force, politics, and extra-economic coercion in the creation of large landed estates. In Marx's words, in actual history, it is notorious that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, briefly, force, play the great part. Footnote. Karl Marx, Capital, New York, International, 1967. 1. Page 714. Marx was referring, of course, to primitive accumulation of capital, but his words have application to other forms of property. And Mises. Nowhere and at no time has the large-scale ownership of land come into being through the workings of economic forces in the market. It is the result of military and political effort. Founded by violence, it has been upheld by violence, and that alone. As soon as the latifundia are drawn into the sphere of market transactions, they begin to crumble, until at last they disappear completely. Footnote. Ludwig von Mises, Socialism, an Economic and Sociological Analysis. London, Jonathan Cape, 1951, page 375. With the growth of urban economies in Western Europe, the revival of Mediterranean trade during the Renaissance, and the development of modern banking and credit mechanisms, despite the inherited religious doctrine condemning usury, market relations penetrated the countryside, gradually undermining and transforming the senescent order of feudalism. This process, whose eloquent heralds include Marx, Max Weber, Barrington Moore Jr., and Emanuel Wallerstein, made for a hybrid transitional society in which pre-capitalist and capitalist attitudes and institutions uneasily coexisted. Footnote. See Max Weber, Capitalism and Rural Society in Germany, from Max Weber, Essays in Sociology, edited by Hans Gerth and C. Wright Mills, New York, OUP, 1958, pages 363 to 385, Barrington Moore, Jr., Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, 
Boston, Beacon, 1966, Emanuel Wallerstein, The Modern World System, New York, Academic, 1974. Lost in the historical shuffle was small commodity production, a possible mode of production in its own right and an alternative to both feudalism and capitalism. Only recently have Marxist scholars paid serious attention to this topic. Footnote. See Robert Brenner, The Origins of Capitalist Development, A Critique of Neo-Smithian Marxism. New Left Review, July to August, 1977, especially pages 88 to 90. Claudio Katz, Karl Marx on the Transition from Feudalism to Capitalism, Theory and Society 22, June 1993, pages 363 to 389. Arthur de Quattro, The Labor Theory of Value and Simple Commodity Production, Science and Society, 71, October 2007, pages 455 to 483. In these circumstances, the land question loomed large. Its resolution, one way or another, threatened some sections of society as much as it boded well for others. Some writers, not as sanguine as Mises concerning the tendency of market relations to dissolve large holdings of land, emphasized the persistence of political forces and economic positions stemming from the feudal past into modern times. For Franz Oppenheimer, Alexander Rousteau, Wilhelm Rolpk, J.S. Mill, Joseph Schumpeter, Arno Mayer, and others, remnants of the past significantly conditioned early capitalism, bringing about political economies in the West that fell rather short of the ideal market economy of classical liberal theory and aspirations. Footnote. See Franz Oppenheimer, The State, New York, Free Life, 1975-1914. Wilhelm Röpke, The Social Crisis of Our Time, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1950. Joseph Schumpeter, Imperialism and Social Classes, New York, Meridian, 1955. Rousteau, Mayer. A few quotations must suffice. The near-anarchist liberal poet Shelley wrote that large-scale property has its foundation in usurpation or imposture or violence, without which, by the nature of things, immense possessions of gold or land could never have been accumulated. Of this nature is the principal part of the property enjoyed by the aristocracy and the great fundholders, the great majority of whose ancestors never deserved it by their skill and talents, or acquired or created it by their personal labor. Footnote. Percy Bishy Shelley, Political Writings, edited by Roland Duckerson, New York, Appleton, 1970, page 140. Despite the relatively early rise of commercial relations in England, John Stuart Mill could write that the principle of private property has never yet had a fair trial in any country, and less so, perhaps, in this country than in some others. And, Notwithstanding what industry has been doing for many centuries to modify the work of force, the system still retains many and large traces of its origin. Footnote. John Stuart Mill, Principles of Political Economy, London, Longmans, 1909, 1891, page 208. More recently, writing of the primal distribution of property, rather than Marx's primitive accumulation, Franz Oppenheimer said, Rising capitalism inherited from its predecessor, feudal absolutism. Capitalism took over all of feudalism's basic institutions, especially two, the privileges of state administration and the monopoly of land. Footnote, Franz Oppenheimer, A Critique of Political Economy 2, A Postmortem on Cambridge Economics. American Journal of Economics and Sociology 2, July 1943, page 535. In a world increasingly unified by merchant capital, Western imperialism, and, a bit more tardily, industry, the land question has persisted right up to the present. Footnote. Land is at the center of the problems in the Middle East. See Stephen Holbrook, The Alienation of a Homeland, How Palestine Became Israel. Journal of Libertarian Studies 5, Fall 1981, pages 357 to 374. Whether or not they have followed the liberal democratic road, the Prussian road of revolution from above, or the road of mass-based peasant revolutions led and typically betrayed by Marxist revolutionaries, countries the world over have had to address the problem of modernizing agrarian relations. Footnote, the three roads to modernization came from more social origins. <laughs>
In case after case, the access of ordinary people to land and markets has been controlled ultimately by the constellation of political forces. It seems safe to say that the issue has seldom been settled in the interest of peasantries. The level of popular discontent and land hunger is perhaps summarized best in the vast emigrations from the British Isles and Western Europe to various parts of what Walter Prescott Webb called the Great Frontier. Just as the moving land frontier functioned in some sense as a safety valve for discontent in the eastern states of the United States, so North America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa functioned on a grander scale as a safety valve for European society generally. Footnote Walter Prescott Webb, The Great Frontier, Boston, Houghton, 1952. On emigration from Britain spurred by enclosure, specifically from Scotland and Northern England, see Bernard Balin, Voyagers to the West, New York, Knopf, 1987, pages 43 to 49, 291, 375 to 376, and 606 to 608. The English enclosures, standing as they do as a centerpiece in the ongoing optimist-pessimist debate over the Industrial Revolution, will be the first instance of agrarian collectivization or consolidation discussed in these pages. A brief aside on Latin American latifundismo will precede the treatment of another significant model of agrarian change, Soviet collectivization, as a bureaucratic enclosure movement. The comparison of the English enclosures with Soviet collectivization should yield interesting insights into how, or how not, to reform an agrarian sector. To anticipate a bit, it may be that neither collectivization for a commercially active minority, the English example, nor enclosures directed by bureaucracy, the Soviet example, with its disturbing resemblances to something like an Asiatic mode of production, provide an ideal path to modernization at least if peasant interests and aspirations are given any weight as against competing goals, such as rate of growth or the retention of power by political elites. Footnote. An analysis of communist states as atavistic phenomena is presented in Carl A. Wittfogel, Oriental Despotism, New York, Vintage, 1981-1957. But see Perry Anderson, Lineages of the Absolute State. London, Verso, 1979, pages 462 to 549, The Asiatic Mode of Production. The English Enclosures and a Rural Reserve Army The debate among historians over the enclosure resolves itself into approximately the same optimist and pessimist camps that continue to argue the costs and benefits of industrialization in late 18th and early 19th century England. In rough summary, the optimists tend to see enclosure, as it actually took place, as essential to the introduction of technical improvements, new crop rotations, and more effective economic organization of the English countryside. This made it possible more effectively to feed England's growing population, a part of which would subsequently be available as wage laborers in incipient industries. The optimists tend to accept the fairness of the commissions on enclosure and would minimize the dislocations occurring as marginal peasants were moved off the land over the course of several centuries. Footnote, Jonathan D. Chambers and Gordon E. Mingay, Enclosures Not Guilty, in Philip A. M. Taylor, Editor, The Industrial Revolution in Britain, Triumph or Disaster, Lexington, Massachusetts, Heath, 1970, page 53. The very slowness and complexity of the enclosure movement suggest that the optimist case can be proven, on its own terms, in some narrow selection of cases, but since those terms tend to rule out the most interesting problems, the jury is still out, and a whole new literature challenging the optimists has arisen in the decades since the latter declared victory. Footnote CN64 Infra for T.S. Ashton, the essential point about enclosure is that it brought about an increase in the productivity of the soil. For Jonathan Chambers and Gordon Mingay, enclosure shows how large gains in economic efficiency and output could be achieved by reorganization of existing resources. David Landis merely remarks that the improving landlords were a powerful leaven. Sir John Clapham remains content to describe the details of enclosure, making no judgment at all. Footnote. T.S. Ashton, The Industrial Revolution, 1760-1830. to 1830.
London, OUP, 1948, 26, Chambers and Mingay, Enclosures, 63, David S. Landis, The Unbound Prometheus, Technological Change and Industrial Development in Western Europe from 1750 to the Present, Cambridge, UK, CUP, 1969, 69, and John Clapham, A Concise Economic History of Britain, Cambridge, UK, CUP, 1949, pages 194 to 207, 222 to 224. And the optimist viewpoint is strongly advanced by the writings of Robert Hartwell. Footnote, see R. M. Hartwell, History and Ideology, Studies in History and Philosophy 3, Menlo Park, California, IHS, no date. The South German free market economist Wilhelm Rock, whose economic views reflected a strain of conservative Protestantism, has remarked that the debate over industrialization has been between anti-capitalist intellectuals and anti-intellectual capitalists. For Ropke, the collection of essays edited by F. A. von Hayek, Capitalism and the Historians, has done little to improve the discussion. Footnote, Wilhelm Ropke, A Humane Economy, the Social Framework of the Free Market, Indianapolis, Indiana, Liberty Fund, 1971, pages 227-278. to Friedrich Hayek, Editor, Capitalism and the Historians, Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1954. The pessimist view originated with Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and other contemporary critics of early industrialization, and continues in the work of J.L. and Barbara Hammond, Maurice Dobb, Eric Hobsbawm, and E.P. Thompson. For the pessimists, whose overlap with Marxist economic historians is evident from this partial list, enclosure represents outright expropriation of the main body of English peasants by those who possessed the political power to engross the land. While they conceded, too soon it now appears, the long-range increase in food supply and strictly economic efficiency, the pessimists stress that enclosure was an unmitigated social and economic disaster for the immediate generations of peasants dispossessed. The difference between economic improvement qua system and social disaster for the small and middling peasants is particularly well put by Pauline Gregg. Footnote, Pauline Gregg, Modern Britain, a Social and Economic History Since 1760. New York, Pegasus, 1965, Chapter 1. The nature and course of the enclosures are complex matters indeed. Some of the best accounts of the process are found in the writings of those whom we might call semi-pessimists, such as Paul Mantu, Barrington Moore, Jr., Theta Skokpol, and Pauline Gregg, reaching back perhaps to Thorold Rogers. Footnote See Paul Mantu, The Industrial Revolution in the Eighteenth Century, New York, Harper, 1961, 1928, Chapter 3, The Redistribution of Land, More, Chapter 1, England and the Contribution of Violence to Gradualism, Theta Skokpol, States and Social Revolutions, New York, CUP, 1979, pages 140 to 144, and Gregg, pages 19 to 35. To begin with, one must distinguish between the areas under cultivation as open fields, or narrow strips of land randomly interspersed, such that strips 1, 5, and 9 might belong to one peasant, 2, 6, and 13 to another, and so on, and the wastes, areas on the margin of cultivation where customary rights to pasture, collection of firewood, and other benefits had developed over time. In addition to the open fields and the wastes, large areas of land were given over to commercial agriculture and stock raising by landlords or their large-scale tenant farmers, especially in South and Central England. The situation in the North and in Scotland was somewhat different, but far too complex to deal with here. Footnote. For Scottish developments, see Eric J. Hobsbawm, Scottish Reformers of the Eighteenth Century and Capitalist Agriculture. Peasants in History, edited by Hobswam et al., Delhi, OUP, 1980, pages 3 to 29. Tom Devine, The Highland Clearances, Refresh, 4, Spring, 1987, pages 5 to 8. And Neil Davidson, The Scottish Path to Capitalist Agriculture 2, The Capitalist Offensive, 1749 to 1851. Journal of Agrarian Change, 4, 
October 2004, pages 411 to 460. Besides the complexities of everyday cultivation, the system was crisscrossed by several different degrees of ownership and tenancy, ranging from fee, simple ownership, and long-term leases, through copyhold, down to merely customary tenancies at the will of the landlord. In the course of enclosure, it was precisely those cultivators with modest claims and the weakest legal rights to land who fell by the wayside, becoming part of a rural proletariat. Since the term enclosure applies to any consolidation of open fields or waste into larger, more rational units of production, another point we will return to, and since such consolidations date from Tudor times to the late 18th and early 19th centuries, an especially brisk period, the notion is stretched almost to the breaking point. A great many authorities had to spend a great deal of time and effort to bring order and coherence to the history of the enclosures. Footnote. Two of the clearest short accounts are by Clapham and Gregg. Whatever the merits of the argument that bigger units of production are ipso facto more efficient and productive, the political dominance of large landowners determined the course of enclosure. While improving landlords may have believed the arguments put forward by agricultural reformers and enthusiasts like Jethro Tull and Arthur Young, it was their power in Parliament and as local justices of the peace that enabled them to redistribute the land in their own favor. A typical round of enclosure began when several, or even a single, prominent landholder initiated it. In the great spurt of enclosures in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this was done by petition to Parliament. A parliamentary commission would be set up to work out the details and engineer the appearance of local consensus. Since, as Manteau points out, the commissioners were invariably of the same class and outlook as the major landholders who had petitioned in the first place, it was not surprising that the great landholders awarded themselves the best land and the most of it, thereby making England a classic land of great well-kept estates with a small marginal peasantry and a large class of rural wage laborers. Those with only customary claim to use the land fell by the wayside, as did the marginal cottagers and squatters who had depended on the use of the wastes for their bare survival as partly independent peasants. In addition, better situated men often succumbed to the legal costs built into the enclosure process. The result was, in the words of J. L. and Barbara Hammond, that the enclosures created a new organization of classes. The peasants with rights and a status, with a share in the fortunes and government of his village, standing in rags but standing on his feet, makes way for the laborer with no corporate rights to defend, no corporate power to invoke, no property to cherish, no ambition to pursue, bent beneath the fear of his masters and the weight of a future without hope. No class in the world has so beaten and crouching a history. Footnote J. L. and Barbara Hammond, The Village Laborer, 1760-1832. New York, Harper, 1970-1911, page 81. So a parliament of large landowners set up commissions of large landowners to reform the agrarian sector of English society. Manteau comments that the abuse was so plain that the most determined supporters of the enclosures denounced it emphatically, Arthur Young among them. Footnote. Manteau, page 169. District by district, squatters, cottagers, and small farmers were driven out as self-supporting husbandmen, becoming a free-floating pool of rural labor or immigrating to America. Karl Marx and his successors have stressed the direct connection between the enclosures and the development of an industrial proletariat. Footnote. Marx, 1, page 717-749. Some writers, anxious to rebut the Marxist reading of the matter, have stressed the incremental nature of enclosure and the fairness under circumstances of the commissioners who oversaw the process. See J. D. Chambers, Enclosure and Labor Supply in the Industrial Revolution, Economic History Review, Second Series, 5, 1953, pages 319 to 343. H. J. Habakkuk, English Landownership, 1680 to 1740. Economic History Review, 10, February 1940, pages 2 to 17. W. E. Tate, Members of Parliament and Proceedings Upon Enclosure Bills, Economic History Review, 12, 1942, pages 68 to 75.
To an American outsider, this necessarily seems like another exercise in convenient Whig history, without conceding the precise point the Marxists wish to make. When one of these writers, W. E. Tate, denies that the enclosures were unjust, except in so far as injustice must necessarily occur when one class legislates concerning the property and opportunities of another class, Barrington Moore Jr. comments that the reader may conclude that he has destroyed his own case. Footnote Moore twenty two N. While enclosures did not instantly call into being an industrial reserve army, most authorities would agree that they did create a rural reserve army, many of whose descendants did ultimately become industrial workers or emigrants to the New World. Given the role of political power in the process of enclosure, it does not seem unfair to view enclosure as collectivization of agriculture for the benefit of a narrow class, whether or not it was the only way to increase agricultural efficiency, or whether it did increase it to the degree often supposed, are probably open questions. Falk Dovering writes that the enclosures depended primarily on the de facto power of the landlord class. This naturally raises the question of whether or not England did not, at least in the agrarian sphere, follow a path closer to the Prussian road to capitalism than is usually believed. Footnote Falk Dovering, The Transformation of European Agriculture, The Cambridge Economic History, edited by M. Poston and H. J. Habakkuk, London, C. U. P., 1966, 6.2, 628. 3 land monopoly and latifundismo. According to numerous authorities, Latin American poverty, unemployment, and productivity so low that agricultural countries actually import food are all rooted in latifundismo, or feudal land monopoly, dating from the Spanish and Portuguese conquest and settlement. Footnote. See Charles Gibson, Spain in America, New York, Harper, 1966. Ernest Fetter, the Rape of the Peasantry, Latin America's Landholding System. Garden City, New York, Anchor, 1971. Stanislav Andreski, Parasitism and Subversion, The Case of Latin America. London, Weidenfeld, 1969. And Irving Lewis Horowitz, Jose de Castro, and John Garassi, Editors, Latin American Radicalism, New York, Vintage, 1969. In most of these countries, the landed elites dominate the political structure, with its help they exploit the peasants and maintain an agrarian reserve army of cheap and docile labor by quasi-feudal labor dues, fraud, inflation, which devours small savings, and ultimately armed violence by landlord-sponsored vigilantes or national armies. Footnote. Fetter, pages 3 to 45. Andre Gunder Frank makes a strong case that Latin American economies were capitalist from the very beginning. Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Latin America, New York Monthly Review, 1969, pages 20 to 25. For a comparable reading of North American history, see Andrew Little, The Backwoods Progression, From Eden to Babylon, The Social and Political Essays of Andrew Nelson Little, edited by M. E. Bradford, Washington, D.C., Gateway Regnery, 1990, pages 77 to 94. Michael Merrill, Putting Capitalism in Its Place, A Review of Recent Literature. William and Mary Quarterly, 52, April 1995, pages 317 to 326. According to Ernst Fetter, the concentration of good land in the hands of a very small minority creates gross insufficiency, waste, mismanagement, and low productivity on Latin America's latifundia. Forcefully shut off from the market mechanism, the peasants respond by displaying self-hatred and unambitious behavior, which is then taken to prove their inherent stupidity. Footnote, Fetter, page 148. On forceful exclusion from markets, see, for example, Carol A. Smith, Local History and Global Context, Social and Economic Transitions in Western Guatemala. Comparative Studies in Society and History 26, 1984, pages 193 to 228. John Lai, The Concept of Mode of Exchange, American Sociological Review, 57, August 1992, pages 508 to 523. Built-in disincentives discourage the peasants, who gain nothing from harder work. 
far from reflecting economies of scale arrived at in free markets, the politically based latifundia are so overexpanded that often as much as one third of the workforce is required to boss the other demoralized two thirds. Hence, the great estates resemble nothing so much as islands of socialist calculational chaos, unable to operate at optimum economic rationality. Footnote. On the problem of rational calculation, see Murray and Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State with Power and Market, Second Scholars Edition, Auburn, Alabama, Mises, 2009, pages 614 to 616 and 659 to 661. On Rothbard's analysis, any forcibly maintained monopoly represents a step in the direction of socialism, with the calculational difficulties pointed out in the 1920s by Ludwig von Mises and Max Weber. In contrast, Fetter argues that poor people are actually capable of great economic rationality and capital accumulation. To the extent that a small sector of family farms exists in Latin America, it is here that one finds land-intensive and productive farming as opposed to the better capitalized estate sector. Given the economic irrationality of the quasi-feudal sector and the destitution of peasants who could be productive, Fetter supports land reform both on the grounds of simple justice and economic progress. Like Fetter, the sociologist Stanislav Andreski takes a critical view of the chief structural realities of Latin American society. He believes that most of the problems in those countries stem from an inherited pattern of political parasitism. Interestingly, Andreski derives his conception of parasitism from the Traité de Législation, 1826, the major work of the French sociologist Charles Comte, whose importance as a classical liberal theorist is only now coming to be appreciated. Footnote. On Charles Comte and his colleague Charles Dunoyer, see Leonard Ligio, Charles Dunoyer and French Classical Liberalism, Journal of Libertarian Studies 1, Summer 1977, pages 153 to 178. Parasitism, by severing work from reward, is a necessarily strong barrier to social progress. An important form of parasitism is land monopoly, which restricts production and impoverishes the masses. On this matter, Andreski differs little from Fetter. Direct political appropriations of wealth by Latin American police, customs inspectors, and the like is enormous, according to Andreski. Although conditions vary from country to country, high tariffs, state loans, the licensing and bribery syndrome, government contracts, and even tax farming in Peru contribute to the popular view that all governments are merely bands of thieves. In Mexico, where state intervention is most extensive, payoffs are naturally highest. Everywhere, taxation falls mainly on the poorer classes. Militarism likewise wastes needed resources. Conscription exists in Latin America mainly to justify the bloated officer corps. Since Latin American armies are too large for internal policing and too small for serious foreign adventures, they really are huge bureaucracies which often intervene directly in politics. Their normal care, plus what they rake off while running a country, make their upkeep the most important form of parasitism in Latin America. Footnote, Andreski, pages 1 to 22. Latin America is cursed with a parasitic involution of capitalism, which Andreski defines as the tendency to seek profits and alter market conditions by political means in the widest sense. As a result, the continent suffers from hypertrophy of bureaucracy. Parasitic appropriation of wealth, constricted markets, the result of land monopoly and peasant poverty, uneconomic welfare legislation to buy off the urban poor, and rapid inflation make for permanent economic stagnation. This in turn fosters a permanent political instability. Andreski's general conclusion is that in Latin America, the superimposition of liberal constitutions in seigneurial, feudal economies has led to constitutional oligarchy or outright repression. Footnote Andreski, page 77, 90, and 138. For the human cost of keeping entrenched elites in power in Latin America, see Penny Lerneau, Cry of the People, Garden City, New York, Doubleday, 1980. In Latin America, as in other parts of the world, the underlying importance of the land question and its increasing urgency make its resolution perhaps one of the more important items in the world agenda.
Footnote, Falk Dovering, Land Reform, A Key to Change in Agriculture, Agricultural Policy in Developing Countries, edited by Nurul Islam, New York, Wiley, 1974, page 509 to 521. 4. Soviet Collectivization, A Bureaucratic Enclosure Movement. In pre-industrial Eastern Europe, the role of politics in the economic life of nations had always been apparent. There, the politically powerful landed elites created enormous latifundia in recent times, as David Mitrani put it. Footnote, David Mitrani, Marx Against the Peasant, A Study in Social Dogmatism, New York, Collier, 1961, page 77. To capitalize on new markets for cereals in the West, the lords dispossessed the peasants, retaining them as cheap labor. When World War I broke up the political power of the landed ruling class, the peasant masses rose up everywhere, with the exception of Hungary, and divided the great estates. Unable to do much else, the liberal semi-parliamentary successor regimes in these countries conceded the land seized by the peasants in the post-war period. This revolutionary breakthrough continued the process begun in the French Revolution. The situation in Russia was more complex. There, the serfs had been legally emancipated in the 1860s in a reform from above reminiscent of the Prussian experience in the Napoleonic era. Legally free, Russian peasants found themselves with inadequate amounts of land, the bulk of the land having been retained by the lords, and stiff commutation payments against their land. Footnote C. A. Gershenkron, Agrarian Policies and Industrialization, Russia, 1861 to 1917, in Poston and Habakkuk, page 706 to 800. Gershenkron notes that the smallness of plots plus the commutation fees imposed on the peasants kept them from becoming a significant internal market for Russian manufacturers, page 743. This unsatisfactory situation somewhat paralleled emancipation in the United States, where in the absence of land reform, the ex-slaves fell into the semi-slavery of sharecropping and peonage in the former Confederate states. Footnote, see Eric Foner, Nothing But Freedom, Emancipation and Its Legacy, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Louisiana State University Press, 1983. And on the persistence of the problem, Leo McGee and Robert Boone, editors, The Black Rural Landowner, Endangered Species, Westport, Connecticut, Greenwood, 1979. Thus, when the strains of World War I broke the power and prestige of Russia's czarist regime, discontented peasants supplied a mass base for radical revolution. In what would become a common pattern in the 20th century, land-hungry peasants provided the backbone of a revolution whose leaders, as Marxist and Leninists, had a somewhat different agenda than did the peasantry. Certainly, the Bolshevik leaders of the Russian Revolution were not inclined to let the goals of the struggle be set by the peasants. For decades, socialists had regarded peasants as retrograde individualists and natural enemies of the kinds of centralized direction that socialism demanded. Footnote. This is the theme of Mitt Rainey, pages 19 to 104. Like the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen proletariat, the peasants were the likely source of renewed private accumulation of capital, and therefore, in the rather oversimplified model of base superstructure, the likely source of reactionary, anti-socialist political activity. The first socialist revolution had taken place in a country with an undeveloped proletariat, Having placed themselves at the head of a largely peasant-based revolution, Lenin and his vanguardists faced the very serious problem of how to hold on to power in a country where they and their supposed natural constituency, the industrial working class, were in a decided minority. Footnote. C.P. V.I. Lenin. Can the Bolsheviks retain state power? Selected Works. New York International, 1971. Pages 362 to 400. Lenin characteristically masks his genuine unease with his usual rhetorical overkill. War communism, the attempt in the midst of civil war to leap into socialism by abolishing money and markets, had necessarily proved disastrous. To bring the Russian economy back to life, as well as to conciliate a peasantry restive under forced levies and pro-urban exchange ratios, Lenin announced his strategic retreat from socialism, the New Economic Policy, NEP. 
Soon Lenin himself was writing of the need for freedom of trade and small-scale enterprise and cooperatives as intermediate steps in the path to socialism. He began to worry about dragging Russians out of Asiatic inefficiency and preventing the revival of stifling czarist bureaucracies. Footnote. For example, V. I. Lenin, On Cooperation, Works, page 690-699. For differing views of Lenin and Lenin's NEP, see Stefan Halbrook, Lenin's Bakuninism, International Review of History and Political Science 8, February 1971, pages 89-111. to Alec Nove, Lenin and the New Economic Policy, Lenin and Leninism, State Law and Society, edited by Bernard W. Eisenstadt, London, Lexington, 1971, pages 155 to 171, and V. N. Bandera, The New Economic Policy, NEP, as an Economic System, Journal of Political Economy, 71, 1963, page 265 to 279. Of the three major contenders to party leadership after Lenin's death, Trotsky, Stalin, and Bukharin, it was Bukharin who emerged as the strongest proponent of continuing and extending the NEP free market and pursuing what he called the Worker-Peasant Alliance. Trotsky clung fiercely to the rigid Marxist program of creating heavy industry overnight on the backs of peasants. Stalin held the middle ground and waited to seize power. In this fluid period before Stalin's consolidation of power, significant debates took place over economic policy which had radical implications for the fate of the peasant majority. Footnote. See Alexander Ehrlich, The Soviet Industrialization Debate, 1924-1928, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1960, for a summary of the discussion. On the right, as we are apparently obliged to call it, Bukharin, Rykov, Tomsky, the Institute of Red Professors, and the economist at Narkomfin, the state financial ministry, proposed to continue the NEP. Some at Narkomfin even toyed with bringing back some kind of gold standard. The Bukharinists found themselves advocating a program that in other contexts might have been called peasantist or even Jeffersonian. Footnote. On peasantist programs versus pro-industrial neo-mercantilist programs in Eastern Europe between the World Wars, see Mitt Rainey, pages 115 to 131. See also Alan Carlson, Third Ways, Wilmington, Delaware, ISI 2007, Chapter 4, Green Rising. They saw peasant demand as the key to Soviet economic development. In the context of the NEP free market, the rebuilding of the rural economy would go hand-in-hand with the development of light industries and consumer goods, with heavy industry developing as needed by the first two sectors. Like Lenin, Bukharin had come to fear the rise of a bureaucratic new class of former workers, which would arrogate total control of society to itself. As far back as 1916, he had written of the danger of the state in general. Footnote N. Bukharin, The Imperialist Pirate State, The Bolsheviks and the World War, edited by O. H. Genkin and H. H. Fisher, Stanford, California, Stanford University Press, 1940, pages 236 to 239. Now he was calling for allowing the peasants to enrich themselves as the starting point of Soviet development. His whole program was intended to avoid the level of bureaucratism implied in the program of the left, especially Trotsky and Prio Brzezinski. Isaac Deutscher calls Bukharin a Bolshevik bastiat who extolled Le Harmonie Economique of Soviet society under NEP and prayed that nothing should disturb those harmonies. Footnote, Isaac Deutscher, The Prophet Unarmed, Trotsky, 1921-1929, New York, Vintage, 1959, pages 223 to 234. For more on Bukharin's views, see Alec Nov, Political Economy and Soviet Socialism, London, Allen, 1979, pages 81 to 99. Nikolai Bukharin, Notes of an Economist, The Problem of Planning, Khrushchev and Stalin's Ghost, Text, Background, and Meaning of Khrushchev's Secret Report to the 20th Congress on the Night of February 24th to 25th, 1956, edited by Bertram D. Wolfe, 
New York, Prager, 1957, pages 295 to 315. Nikolai Bukharin, Organized Mismanagement in Modern Society, Essential Works of Socialism, edited by Irving Howe, New York, Bantam, 1971, page 190 to 194. On the left, again an obligatory term, Trotsky, Priobrzezinski, and their ilk called for primitive socialist accumulation of capital to repeat the growth of early capitalism as set forth by Marx in Capital. They wanted to recreate this supposedly necessary stage of economic history under the aegis of the Bolshevik state and telescope the process into a few generations. As some wit has said, Trotsky wanted two stages of history for the price of one. They faced the implication that they would have to exploit the peasant majority to extract an economic surplus with which to build heavy industry, which to them was the essence of development, and would, incidentally, enlarge the proletariat, their supposed political base. Since they were Marxists, such exploitation was morally neutral, a tool in the building of socialism, and not at all the private exploitation of the bad old days. State control of agricultural prices would favor urban areas and heavy industry, and build a modern economy as rapidly as possible. If the peasants didn't like the new arrangements, they would be forced to. Trotsky had never shied away from using force. Footnote on such socialist exploitation, see Deutscher, pages 43 to 46, 234 to 238, and 415 to 416. Unfortunately for both sides, Stalin gradually eased himself into control of the party and state and purged them all. Once firmly in control, he adopted most of the left's economic program, sending cadres of armed party members into the countryside to divide the peasants and push them into collective farms, as called for by ideology and interest. With all kinds of violence and dislocation necessary, the prosperous peasants, the kulaks, were eliminated as a class, many of them physically. Footnote, C. M. Lewin, Russian Peasants and the Soviet Power. New York, W. W. Norton, 1975, and Robert Conquest, The Harvest of Sorrow, New York, O. U. P., 1986. With their much-feared leaders eliminated by the Stalinist terror, the peasants had little choice but to acquiesce in this bureaucratic enclosure movement. Only after Stalin's death could any debate on the direction of Soviet economic policy, however mild, reemerge. Footnote for a rather tepid debate, see the account in Sidney Ploss, Conflict and Decision-Making in Soviet Russia, A Case Study of Agricultural Policy, 1953-1963, to Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1965. The Soviet state itself had become the new landlord. It seems clear enough that the right program was viable. Footnote for an interesting defense of Bukharinism, see Micah Gisser and Paul Jonas, Soviet Growth in the Absence of Centralized Planning, A Hypothetical Alternative, Journal of Political Economy, 82, March to April, 1974, pages 333 to 347, in which the authors allow that industrialization could have taken place at the same rate, or even a more impressive rate, without the preo brzezinski stalin policies, which led to unnecessary sufferings on the part of the Soviet population and misallocation of resources, page 348. Their argument, unfortunately, is subject to the general methodological stricture that econometric models may not actually mean a great deal. For an endorsement of agriculture plus light industry, see John Kenneth Galbraith, Ideology and Agriculture, Harper's, February 1985, pages 15 to 16. Certainly, it did not entail the level of violence, death, and economic destruction required to carry through the Trotsky-Stalin model. But just as in the case of the English enclosures, political power decided the event, not necessarily in the interests of the peasants, short or long run. Perhaps the two cases, though they differ considerably, will shed light on some persistent fallacies concerning peasants, agriculture, and development. 5. Conclusion Mercantilism and Applied German Idealism versus Peasantries, Markets, and Balanced Development. <laughs> 
The political success of the large estate system in England led many observers wrongly to conclude that large-scale agricultural enterprise was inherently efficient and progressive. Conversely, small-scale family-operated peasant farms came to be viewed as uneconomic, backward, reactionary obstacles to progress. Despite the obvious spectacular success of small farms in the non-slaveholding portions of the 19th century United States, the model that Bukharin came to embrace and extol, a curious alliance of Tories and technocrats, including the Marxists, asked nothing so much from progress as that peasants be swept away by large-scale enterprise, whether private or collectivist. Edward Gibbon Wakefield, for example, urged that the distribution of land in Britain's colonies be handled in such a way as to reproduce the class structure and concentration of capital characteristic of the mother country. Footnote, Bernard Semmel, The Philosophic Radicals and Colonialism, Journal of Economic History 21, December 1961, pages 513 to 525. Marx, while critical of Wakefield as a bourgeois thinker, offered little or no quarter to small-scale farming, since as a form of simple commodity production it was doomed to succumb first to bourgeois concentration of property, then to socialist organization of agricultural battalions. Footnote. Marx 1, pages 765 to 774. Marx ignores the implications of his own argument. Strangely, he did seem to use the income which once went to small, direct producers as an implicit measure of exploitation and surplus value. Footnote, Marx 1, Part 7. It is perhaps unfortunate that the English experience became the basis of so much theorizing on economic growth. As Falk Dovering writes, a principal origin of the myth of the large farm is clearly in the victory of the estate system in England through the enclosure movement from the 16th to the early 19th centuries. How mythical the beneficence of the English large estate was has become clear from research showing how little agricultural progress really was achieved in the 18th century. Since the early socialists accepted the economic rationale of large-scale agricultural enterprise put forward by the defenders of Britain's landed elite, it is not surprising that they were hostile from the beginning to peasant aspirations. To quote Dovering again, the parallel strands of ideology from English aristocracy and Marxist socialism have done much over the years to discredit small-scale peasant farming despite its success in Europe and Asia. Footnote Dovering, 520, both quotations. This mesalliance still has much influence on the economic policies of the post-colonial Third World, where many governments prefer tax-intensive super-projects of capital investment in heavy industry, for example steel mills, nuclear power plants, in countries that barely feed themselves. Some economists are beginning to question this preferred model of development and are suggesting that the Jeffersonian slash peasantist slash Bukharinist program of letting small scale farmers take the lead is the soundest path in agrarian societies with an abundance of labor and a shortage of everything else. Thus, John Kenneth Galbraith writes that socialism does not easily preempt the self-motivated farm proprietor and urges the undeveloped countries to allow agricultural prices to rise to their natural level to stimulate production rather than subsidizing city dwellers at the expense of farmers. Footnote, Galbraith, 16. Economist Sudha Shanoi argues that to achieve a working, integrated capital structure, third world governments should not pour investment into higher order goods for heavy industry, but should start where their economies are. In these areas, the kinds of investment that would raise final output are more in the agricultural sector. Footnote, Sudha Shanoi, Two Applications of Hayekian Capital Theory, Unpublished Paper, No Date, Page 3. In fairness, it should be noted that the late Dr. Shinoy took a radically different view of enclosures than the one proposed here. P.T. Bauer, longtime critic of Third World Policies, says, It is a crude error to equate capital formation with specific types of heavy industry. Footnote, P.T. Bauer, Planning and Development, Ideology and Realities, Unpublished Paper, No Date, Page 7. Dovering observes that on the basis of family farming, a future more broadly based cadre of business entrepreneurs tends to emerge. Footnote, 
Dovering, page 519. The belief in the superior efficiency of large-scale units as such, and in all markets at all times, extends far beyond the discussion on agriculture. Here, too, we can spy the same underlying ideological alliance of Marxists and the conservative and post-classical liberal thinkers, who may best be understood as corporatists. Footnote. On corporatism, see R. Jeffrey Lustig, Corporate Liberalism, The Origins of Modern American Political Economy, 1890-1920. Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 1982. Noting the identity between the economic views of conservative corporatists like Theodore Roosevelt and the Marxists as regards economic concentration, Walter Karp writes that the political distortions engendered by class analysis are well illustrated in a common ideological treatment of America's small farmers. Since they, like small businessmen, were anti-monopoly, they have often been categorized as capitalists. One result of this is that the great populist revolt against the party machines is often described as essentially conservative. This is because small capitalists, by ideological definition, are in the backwash of history trying to hold back social change, a mealy-mouthed way of saying that the oligarchs were trying to get rid of them. Mutatis mutandis. The same things could be said of the English yeomen or the Russian kulaks. According to Tories, neo-mercantilists, and Marxists, peasants and the petty bourgeois are doomed to be overrun by the locomotive of history, whether in the name of efficiency, progress, or socialism. To quote Karp once more, ideological categories always describe as natural, inevitable, or inherent what the wielders of corrupt power are actively trying to accomplish. Footnote. Walter Karp indispensable enemies the politics of misrule in america baltimore penguin 1974 page 179 both quotes the obvious question is were other outcomes conceivable for england or russia a counterfactual england the english civil war of the 1640s provided perhaps the best opportunity for a measure of agrarian reform for better or for worse, the revolution remained under the control of the men around Cromwell, who were little disposed to unleash the forces that might destroy them. Even the levelers, who were radical libertarians and not primitive socialists, largely shied away from raising any agrarian questions, although some effort was made to obtain freeholder status for copyholders. Footnote C. B. McPherson, The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism, Hobbes to Locke. London, OUP, 1962, pages 107 to 591. At the height of the enclosures, one or two critics suggested alternative paths. We have already seen that Arthur Young, once an impatient advocate of enclosure, came to criticize the process. Among the most interesting proposals were those of the Reverend David Davies, who wrote The Case of Laborers in Husbandry, 1795. Davies sought to get something for the small man out of the process of agrarian change. Allow the cottager a little land about his dwelling for keeping a cow, for planting potatoes, for raising flax or hemp. Secondly, convert the wastelands of the kingdom into small arable farms, a certain quantity every year, to be let on favorable terms to industrious families. Thirdly, restrain the engrossment and over-enlargement of farms. Footnote, quoted from Hammond and Hammond, page 58. Such proposals, had they been implemented, might have slightly lessened the pace of industrialization while making the transition easier for cottagers and other poor farmers. Plans for agrarian reform became part of the English radical tradition, from Payne and Shelley through Corbett, down to G. K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc, among others. As things actually happened, land-hungry Britons had to remove to North America and undertake their political and agrarian revolutions there, especially if we take the Homestead Acts as an attempt at land reform in advance, despite its ultimate failure. But even the efficiency argument for the enclosures may not be conclusive. Writing of the continental experience, Dovering says, The allegation often made that land consolidation is a prerequisite of the use of modern crop rotations has not been borne out by experience, whatever damage fragmentation has done to the technical and economic efficiency of labor and capital. Footnote, Dovering, page 631. 
for migration out of the British Isles, see again Balin, pages 43 to 49, 291, 375 to 376, and 606 to 608. Hence, a course of modernization more like that of France, though one could hope with less bureaucracy, would not have been impossible for England. Newer writing on enclosure strongly suggests reopening the whole debate. Footnote. See, for example, Jeffrey W. Bentley, Economic and Ecological Approaches to Land Fragmentation in Defense of a Much Maligned Phenomenon. Annual Review of Anthropology, 1967, pages 31 to 67. John Seville, Primitive Accumulation and Early Industrialization in Britain. Socialist Register, London, Merlin, 1969, pages 247 to 271. William Lazonic, Karl Marx and Enclosures in England, Review of Radical Political Economics, 6, 1974, pages 1 to 59. E. Thompson, Customs in Common, London, Penguin, 1993. R. C. Allen, Enclosure and the Yeoman, Oxford, Clarendon, OUP, 1992. M. E. Turner, Enclosures in Britain, 1750 to 1830, Second Edition, London, Macmillan, 1984, and J. M. Neeson, Commoners, Common Rights, Enclosure and Social Change in England, 1700 to 1820, Cambridge, C. U. P. 1993. B. A Counterfactual Russia. Only a few diehards would now defend the course of Soviet collectivization under Stalin. Even so, a great many economists and historians remain enamored of the notion that something like it was necessary to industrialize and modernize a backward peasant society. In the face of the growing critique of the centralized model of development, this position no longer seems tenable. The emergence in the 1960s of market socialism and subsequent reforms from the 1970s onward in Eastern Europe and later China seemed partial vindications of Bukharin and foretold the eventual decision of purely economic issues in favor of the right deviationists of the 1920s. Footnote See Wladzimir's Bruce, The Market in a Socialist Economy, London, Routledge, 1972. Gary North, The Crisis in Soviet Economic Planning, Modern Age 14, Winter 1969-1970, pages 49-56. to Gregory Grossman, Editor, Value and Plan, Economic Calculation and Organization in Eastern Europe, Berkeley, California, University of California Press, 1960. V. V. Kusin, Editor, The Czechoslovak Reform Movement, Oxford, OUP, 1973. Radislav Seluki, Economic Reforms in Eastern Europe, New York, Prager, 1972. Strangely, Stefan Cohen's Bukharinism and the Bolshevik Revolution, New York, Knopf, 1973, underestimates the value of Bukharin's economic program. A turn toward markets became inevitable, even if in practice internal gangsters and outside imperialists, NATO, reaped most of the gains. Unfortunately for Soviet society in the 1920s, sheer lack of experience with non-centralized economic management and Stalin's ability to seize the already dangerous political machinery created by Lenin combined to prevent a reasonable reform of Russia's agrarian economy. As with the enclosures, political power proved decisive, although other outcomes would not have been impossible in principle. Afterward on Enclosures, 2011 Accumulating evidence would seem to suggest new approaches to modern history. Instead of a simple transition from feudalism to capitalism, we actually find considerable continuity between these supposedly opposed systems, and along with that continuity, cumulative change yielding capitalism as we know it. Mercantilism and merchant capitalism flowed from the new forms of society and state, which conserved feudal land monopoly and certain feudal attributes and behaviors, while creating new commercial openings by which well-connected merchant adventurers and large landholders could profit from controlled trade, especially in overseas empires. Footnote, in addition to Mayer, Krishan Kumar, Pre-Capitalist and Non-Capitalist Factors in the Development of Capitalism, Fred Hirsch and Joseph Schumpeter, Dilemmas of Liberal Democracies, edited by Adrian Ellis and Krishan Kumar, London, Tavistock, 1983, pages 151 to 166.
Thus, alongside Moore's Three Roads Away from Feudalism, where feudal absolutism is actually meant, the Anglo-American democratic, the Prussian revolution from above, as in Germany and Japan, and finally, mass-based peasant revolution followed by communist rule. There perhaps existed another route hinted at by Eric Hobswam, the peasant road to capitalism, partially realized in North America, if only for a season. Footnote, Moore, Hobswam, Scottish Reformers, page 21. We may quarrel with Hobswam's choice of the word capitalism here. Along with the new literature on enclosures, referred to earlier, this reorientation threatens to undermine received Whiggish analyses of modern history in a way that should reinforce inquiry into small commodity production as a potentially distinct mode of production and an alternate way of life. Footnote, Jeff Kennedy, Digger Radicalism and Agrarian Capitalism, Historical Materialism 14, 2006, pages 113 to 143 maintains that even the supposedly pro-communist Gerard Whitstanley was mainly interested in preventing the spread of wage labor where it did not already exist in favor of small-scale production. The bottom line seems to be this. In 1500, England had a large peasantry, but by 1820, that class had virtually disappeared. Fear of conceding anything to Marx, who, after all, must occasionally be right, has blocked the vision of classical liberals investigating this disappearance. But 300 years of English agrarian history cannot easily squeeze themselves into a Whig story in which the forces of production demanded new relations of production, which done, everyone lived happily ever after, full stop. It might be added that improving landlords had many levers, and not just enclosure, with which to rid themselves of unwanted peasants. They did, however, improve their rent rolls. Referring to the pre-enclosure organization of English farming, Michael Turner writes, If in so many ways the gains from enclosure are in doubt, yet the damage is plain to see, then we must ask ourselves, if it wasn't broken, why did we fix it? Footnote, Michael Turner, Enclosures Reopened, Refresh 26, Spring 1998, page 4. The question is best addressed to those classes that desired and brought about the new order of agrarian capitalism. Healthcare and Radical Monopoly Kevin A. Carson, 2010 in a recent article for Tikkun, Dr. Arnold Relman argued that the versions of healthcare reform currently proposed by progressives all primarily involve financing healthcare and expanding coverage to the uninsured rather than addressing the way current models of service delivery make it so expensive. Editing out all the pro forma tut tutting of private markets, the substance that's left is considerable. What are those inflationary forces? Most important among them are the incentives in the payment and organization of medical care that cause physicians, hospitals, and other medical care facilities to focus at least as much on income and profit as on meeting the needs of patients. The incentives in such a system reward and stimulate the delivery of more services. That is why medical expenditures in the U.S. are so much higher than in any other country and are rising more rapidly. Physicians who supply the services control most of the decisions to use medical resources. The economic incentives in the medical market are attracting the great majority of physicians into specialty practice, and these incentives, combined with the continued introduction of new and more expensive technology, are a major factor in causing inflation of medical expenditures. Physicians and ambulatory care and diagnostic facilities are largely paid on a piecework basis for each item of service provided. As a healthcare worker, I have personally witnessed this kind of mutual log rolling between specialists and the never ending addition of tests to the bill without any explanation to the patient. The patient simply lies in bed and watches an endless parade of unknown doctors poking their heads in the door for a microsecond, along with an endless series of lab techs drawing bodily fluids for one test after another that's been ordered, with no further explanation. The post-discharge avalanche of bills includes duns from two or three dozen doctors, most of whom the patient couldn't pick out of a police lineup. It's the same kind of quid pro quo that takes place in academia, with professors assigning each other's extremely expensive and copyrighted texts, and systematically citing each other's works in order to game their stats in the social sciences citation index. I was also a grad assistant once. <laughs> 
You might also consider Dilbert creator Scott Adams' account of what happens when you pay programmers for the number of bugs they fix. One solution to this particular problem is to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the patient and a general practitioner on retainer. That's how the old lodge practice worked. Footnote, see David Beto, Lodge Doctors and the Poor, The Freeman Ideas on Liberty, 44.5, May 1994, pages 220 to 225, thefreemanonline.org. But that's illegal, you know. In New York City, John Mooney recently introduced an updated version of Lodge Practice, the AMG Medical Group, which for a monthly premium of $79 and a flat office fee of $10 per visit, provides a wide range of services limited to what its own practitioners can perform in-house. But because AMG is a fixed-rate plan and doesn't charge more for unplanned procedures, the New York Department of Insurance considers it an unlicensed insurance policy. Mooney may agree, unwillingly, to a settlement arranged by his lawyer in which he charges more for unplanned procedures like treatment for a sudden ear infection. So the state is forcing a modern-day lodge practitioner to charge more, thereby keeping the medical and insurance cartels happy, all in the name of protecting the public. How's that for irony? Regarding expensive machinery, I wonder how much of the cost is embedded rent on patents or regulatorily mandated overhead. I'll bet if you removed all the legal barriers that prevent a bunch of open-source hardware hackers from reverse-engineering a homebrew version of it, you could get an MRI machine with a 20-fold reduction in cost. I know that's the case in an area I'm more familiar with, micromanufacturing technology. For example, the RepRap, a homebrew open-source 3D printer, costs roughly $500 in materials to make, compared to tens of thousands for proprietary commercial versions. More generally, the system is racked by artificial scarcity, as editor Sheldon Richman observed in an interview a few months back. For example, licensing systems limit the number of practitioners and arbitrarily impose levels of educational overhead beyond the requirements of the procedures actually being performed. Libertarians sometimes, and rightly, use grocery insurance as an analogy to explain medical price inflation. If there were such a thing as grocery insurance with low deductibles to provide third-party payments at the checkout register, people would be buying a lot more ribeye and porterhouse steaks and a lot less hamburger. The problem we've got is a regulatory system that outlaws hamburger and compels you to buy porterhouse if you're going to buy anything at all. It's a multiple-tier finance system with one tier of service. Dental hygienists can't set up independent teeth cleaning practices in most states, and nurse practitioners are required to operate under a physician's supervision when he's out golfing. No matter how simple and straightforward the procedure, you can't hire someone who's adequately trained just to perform the service you need. You've got to pay amortization on a full med school education and residency. Drug patents have the same effect, increasing the cost per pill by up to 2,000%. They also have a perverse effect on drug development, diverting R&D money primarily into developing Me Too drugs that tweak the formulas of drugs whose patents are about to expire just enough to allow repatenting. Drug company propaganda about high R&D costs as a justification for patents to recoup capital outlays is highly misleading. A major part of the basic research for identifying therapeutic pathways is done in small biotech startups or a taxpayer expense in university laboratories and then bought up by big drug companies. The main expense of the drug companies is the FDA-imposed testing regimen, and most of that is not to test the version actually marketed, but to secure patent lockdown on other possible variants of the marketed version. In other words, gaming the patent system grossly inflates R&D spending. The prescription medicine system, along with state licensing of pharmacists and Drug Enforcement Administration licensing of pharmacies, is another severe restraint on competition. At the local natural foods cooperative, I can buy foods in bulk at a generic commodity price. Even organic flour, sugar, and other items are usually cheaper than the name brand conventional equivalent at the supermarket. Such food cooperatives have their origins in the food buying clubs of the 1970s, which applied the principle of bulk purchasing. The pharmaceutical licensing system obviously prohibits such bulk purchasing unless you can get a licensed pharmacist to cooperate.
I work with a nurse from a farming background who frequently buys veterinary-grade drugs to treat her family for common illnesses without paying either Big Pharma's markup or the price of an office visit. Veterinary supply catalogs are also quite popular in the homesteading and survivalist movements, as I understand. Two years ago, I had a bad case of poison ivy and made an expensive office visit to get a prescription for prednisone. The next year, the poison ivy came back. I'd been weeding the same area on the edge of my garden and had exactly the same symptoms as before. But the doctor's office refused to give me a new prescription without my first coming in for an office visit at full price. For my own safety, of course. So I ordered prednisone from a foreign online pharmacy and got enough of the drug for half a dozen bouts of poison ivy, all for less money than that office visit would have cost me. Of course, people who resort to these kinds of measures are putting themselves at serious risk of harassment from law enforcement. But until 1914, as Sheldon Richmond pointed out, adult citizens could enter a pharmacy and buy any drug they wished, from headache powders to opium. Footnote, Sheldon Richman, The Right to Self-Treatment, Freedom Daily, Future of Freedom Foundation, January 1995, FFF.org. The main impetus to creating the licensing system on which artificial scarcity depends came from the medical profession early in the 20th century. As described by Richman, accreditation of medical schools regulated how many doctors would graduate each year. Licensing similarly metered the number of practitioners and prohibited competitors, such as nurses and paramedics, from performing services they were perfectly capable of performing. Finally, prescription laws guaranteed that people would have to see a doctor to obtain medicines they had previously been able to get on their own. The medical licensing cartels were also the primary force behind the move to shut down lodge practice mentioned above. In the case of all these forms of artificial scarcity, the government creates a honeypot by making some forms of practice artificially lucrative. It's only natural under those circumstances that healthcare business models gravitate to where the money is. Healthcare is a classic example of what Ivan Illich, in Tools for Conviviality, called a radical monopoly. State-sponsored crowding out makes other cheaper, but often more appropriate, forms of treatment less usable, and renders cheaper but adequate treatments artificially scarce. Artificially centralized, high-tech, and skill-intensive ways of doing things make it harder for ordinary people to translate their skills and knowledge into use value. The state's regulations put an artificial floor beneath overhead cost so that there's a markup of several hundred percent to do anything. Decent, comfortable poverty becomes impossible. A good analogy is subsidies to freeways and urban sprawl, which make our feet less usable and raise living expenses by enforcing artificial dependence on cars. Local building codes primarily reflect the influence of building contractors, so competition from low-cost, unconventional techniques, T-slot and other modular designs, vernacular materials like bales and papercrete, and so on, is artificially locked out of the market. Charles Johnson described the way governments erect barriers to people meeting their own needs and make comfortable subsistence artificially costly in the specific case of homelessness in Scratching By, How the Government Creates Poverty as We Know It. Footnote, Chapter 41, pages 377 to 384 in this volume. The organizational culture of healthcare is a classic example of what Paul Goodman, in People or Personnel, called the Great Kingdom of Cost Plus. Their patents and rents, fixed prices, union scales, feather bedding, fringe benefits, status salaries, expense accounts, proliferating administration, paperwork, permanent overhead, public relations and promotions, waste of time and skill by departmentalizing task roles, bureaucratic thinking that is penny-wise, pound-foolish, inflexible procedure and tight scheduling that exaggerates contingencies and overtime. Hospitals use the same slowness accounting system as the rest of corporate America, but in more extreme form. Sloanism treats labor as the only real variable or direct cost and views inventory as an asset. Under this accounting system, fixed expenses like capital projects and administrative costs don't really matter because they are passed on to the customer as a markup for general overhead. Under the slowness management accounting system, overhead is simply included in the cost of goods which are sold to inventory and is thereby transformed into an asset 
As practiced in hospitals in particular, this means enormous markups for tests and patient supplies. So while administrators obsessively look for ways to reduce nursing staff and shave a few minutes here and there off of direct labor, they pour enormous sums of money down capital improvement rat holes and featherbed the organization with multiple layers of administrative bureaucracy without a qualm. These things don't count as costs because they can be passed on to the patient in the form of $10 aspirins and $300 bags of saline. It's the same organizational culture of cost-plus markup that led to the Pentagon's $600 toilet seat. The major proposals for health care reform that went before Congress would do little or nothing to address the institutional sources of high cost. As Jesse Walker argued at Reason.com, a 100% single-payer system, far from being a radical solution, would still accept the institutional premises of the present medical system. Consider the typical American healthcare transaction. On one side of the exchange, you'll have one of an artificially limited number of providers, many of them concentrated in those enormous faceless institutions called hospitals. On the other side, making the purchase is not a patient, but one of those enormous faceless institutions called insurers. The insurers, some of which are actual arms of the government and some of which merely owe their customers to the government's tax incentives and shape their coverage to fit the government's mandates, are expected to pay all or a share of even routine medical expenses. The result is higher costs, less competition, less transparency, and in general, a system where the consumer gets about as much autonomy and respect as the stethoscope. Radical reform would restore power to the patient. Instead, the issue on the table is whether the behemoths we answer to will be purely public or public-private partnerships. Footnote, Jesse Walker, Obama is no radical. Reason. Reason Foundation, September 30th, 2009, Reason.com. I'm a strong advocate of cooperative models of healthcare finance, like the Ithaca Health Alliance, created by the same people, including Paul Glover, who created the Ithaca Hours local currency system, or the friendly societies and mutuals of the 19th century described by writers like Peter Kropotkin and E.P. Thompson. But far more important than reforming finance is reforming the way delivery of service is organized. Consider the libertarian alternatives that might exist. A neighborhood cooperative clinic might keep a doctor of family medicine or a nurse practitioner on retainer along the lines of the lodge practice system. The doctor might have his med school debt and his malpractice premiums assumed by the clinic in return for accepting a reasonable upper middle class salary. As an alternative to arbitrarily inflated educational mandates, on the other hand, there might be many competing tiers of professional training depending on the patient's needs and ability to pay. There might be a free market equivalent of the Chinese barefoot doctors. Such practitioners might attend school for a year and learn enough to identify and treat common infectious diseases, simple traumas, and so on. For example, the barefoot doctor at your neighborhood cooperative clinic might listen to your chest, do a sputum culture, and give you a round of zithro for your pneumonia. He might stitch up a laceration or set a simple fracture. His training would include recognizing cases that were clearly beyond his competence and calling in a doctor for backup when necessary. He might provide most services at the cooperative clinic, with several clinics keeping a common MD on retainer for more serious cases he would be certified by a professional association or guild of his choice, chosen from among competing guilds based on its market reputation for enforcing high standards. That's how competing kosher certification bodies work today without any government-defined standards. Such voluntary licensing bodies, unlike state licensing boards, would face competition, and hence, unlike state boards, would have a strong market incentive to police their memberships in order to maintain a reputation for quality. The clinic would use generic medicines, of course, since that's all that would exist in a free market, since local juries or arbitration bodies would likely take a much more common-sense view of the standards for reasonable care, there would be far less pressure for expensive CYA testing and far lower malpractice premiums. Basic care could be financed by monthly membership dues with additional catastrophic care insurance, cheap and with a high deductible, available to those who wanted it. The monthly dues might be as cheap or even cheaper than Dr. Mooney's. 
It would be a no-frills, bare-bones system, true enough, but to the 40 million or so people who are currently uninsured, it would be a pretty damn good deal. Scratching by. How government creates poverty as we know it. Charles W. Johnson, 2007. The experience of oppressed people is that the living of one's life is confined and shaped by forces and barriers which are not accidental or occasional and hence avoidable, but are systematically related to each other in such a way as to catch one between and among them and restrict or penalize motion in any direction. It is the experience of being caged in. All avenues in every direction are blocked or booby-trapped. Marilyn Fry, Oppression in The Politics of Reality Governments, state, local, and federal, spend a lot of time wringing their hands about the plight of the urban poor. Look around any government agency, and you'll never fail to find some know-it-all with a suit and a nameplate on his desk who has just the right government program to eliminate or ameliorate, or at least contain, the worst aspects of grinding poverty in American cities, especially as experienced by black people, immigrants, people with disabilities, and everyone else marked for the special observation and solicitude of the state bureaucracy. Depending on the bureaucrat's frame of mind, his pet programs might focus on doling out conditional charity to deserving poor people, or putting more at-risk poor people under the surveillance of social workers and medical experts, or beating up recalcitrant poor people and locking them in cages for several years. But the one thing that the government and its managerial aid workers will never do is just get out of the way and let poor people do the things that poor people naturally do, and have always done, to scratch by. Government anti-poverty programs are a classic case of the therapeutic state setting out to treat disorders created by the state itself. Urban poverty as we know it is, in fact, exclusively a creature of state intervention in consensual economic dealings. This claim may seem bold, even to most libertarians, but a lot turns on the phrase, as we know it. Even if absolute laissez-faire reigned beginning tomorrow, there would still be people in big cities who are living paycheck to paycheck, heavily in debt, homeless, jobless, or otherwise at the bottom rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. These conditions may be persistent social problems, and it may be that free people in a free society will still have to come up with voluntary institutions and practices for addressing them. But in the state regimented market that dominates today, the material predicament that poor people find themselves in, and the arrangements they must make within that predicament, are battered into their familiar shape as if by an invisible fist through the diffuse effects of pervasive interlocking interventions. Confinement and Dependence Consider the commonplace phenomena of urban poverty. Livelihoods in American inner cities are typically extremely precarious. As Sudhir Aladi Venkatesh writes in Off the Books, conditions in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty can change quickly and in ways that can leave families unprepared and without much recourse. Fixed costs of living, rent, food, clothing, and so on, consume most or all of a family's income, with little or no access to credit, savings, or insurance to safeguard them from unexpected disasters. Their poverty often leaves them dependent on other people. It pervades the lives of the employed and the unemployed alike. The jobless fall back on charity or help from family. Those who live paycheck to paycheck with little chance of finding any work elsewhere depend on the good graces of a few select bosses and brokers. One woman quoted by Van Katesh explained why she continued to work through an exploitative labor shark rather than leaving for a steady job with a well-to-do family. And what if that family gets rid of me? Where am I going next? See, I can't take that chance, you know. All I got is Johnny, and it took me the longest just to get him on my side. The daily experience of the urban poor is shaped by geographical concentration in socially and culturally isolated ghetto neighborhoods within the larger city, which have their own characteristic features. Housing is concentrated in dilapidated apartments and housing projects, owned by a select few absentee landlords. Many abandoned buildings and vacant lots are scattered throughout the neighborhood, which remain unused for years at a time. The use of outside spaces is affected by large numbers of unemployed or homeless people. The favorite solutions of the welfare state, government doles and urban renewal projects, mark no real improvement, 
Rather than freeing poor people from dependence on benefactors and bosses, they merely transfer the dependence to the state, leaving the least politically connected people at the mercy of the political process. But in a free market, a truly free market, where individual poor people are just as free as established formal economy players to use their own property, their own labor, their own know how, and the resources that are available to them, the informal enterprising actions by poor people themselves would do far more to systematically undermine or completely eliminate each of the stereotypical conditions that welfare statists deplore. Every day and in every culture from time out of mind, poor people have repeatedly shown remarkable intelligence, courage, persistence, and creativity in finding ways to put food on the table, save money, keep safe, raise families, live full lives, learn, enjoy themselves, and experience beauty whenever, wherever, and to whatever degree they have been free to do so. The fault for despairing, dilapidated urban ghettos lies not in the pressures of the market, nor in the character flaws of individual poor people, nor in the characteristics of ghetto subcultures. The fault lies in the state and its persistent interference with poor people's own efforts to get by through independent work, clever hustling, scratching together resources, and voluntary mutual aid. Housing Crisis Progressives routinely deplore the affordable housing crisis in American cities. In cities such as New York and Los Angeles, about 20 to 25 percent of low-income renters are spending more than half of their incomes just on housing. But it is the very laws that progressives favor, land use policies, zoning codes, and building codes, that ratchet up housing costs, stand in the way of alternative housing options, and confine poor people to ghetto neighborhoods. Historically, when they have been free to do so, poor people have happily disregarded the ideals of political humanitarians and found their own ways to cut housing costs, even in bustling cities with tight housing markets. One way was to get other families, or friends, or strangers to move in and split the rent. Depending on the number of people sharing a home, this might mean a less comfortable living situation. It might even mean one that is unhealthy. But decisions about health and comfort are best made by the individual people who bear the costs and reap the benefits. Unfortunately, today the decisions are made ahead of time by city governments through zoning laws that prohibit or restrict sharing a home among people not related by blood or marriage, and building codes that limit the number of residents in a building. Those who cannot make enough money to cover the rent on their own, and cannot split the rent enough due to zoning and building codes, are priced out of the housing market entirely. Once homeless, they are left exposed not only to the elements, but also to harassment or arrest by the police for loitering or vagrancy, even on public property, in efforts to force them into overcrowded and dangerous institutional shelters. But while government laws make living on the streets even harder than it already is, government intervention also blocks homeless people's efforts to find themselves shelter outside of the conventional housing market. One of the oldest and commonest survival strategies practiced by the urban poor is to find wild or abandoned land and build shanties on it out of salvageable scrap materials. Scrap materials are plentiful, and large portions of land in ghetto neighborhoods are typically left unused as condemned buildings or vacant lots. Formal title is very often seized by the city government or by quasi-governmental development corporations through the use of eminent domain. Lots are held out of use, often for years at a time, while they await government public works projects or developers willing to buy up the land for large-scale building. Urban Homesteading In a free market, vacant lots and abandoned buildings could eventually be homesteaded by anyone willing to do the work of occupying and using them. Poor people could use abandoned spaces within their own communities for setting up shop, for gardening, or for living space. In Miami, in October 2006, a group of community organizers and about 35 homeless people built Umoha Village, a shantytown on an inner-city lot that the local government had kept vacant for years. They publicly stated to the local government that, We have only one demand. Leave us alone. That would be the end of the story in a free market. There would be no eminent domain, no government ownership, and thus also no political process of seizure and redevelopment. Once homeless people could establish property rights to abandoned land through their own sweat equity, without fear of the government's demolishing their work and selling their land out from under them. But back in Miami, the city attorney and city council took about a month to begin legal efforts to destroy the residents' homes and force them off the lot.
In April 2007, the city police took advantage of an accidental fire to enforce its politically fabricated title to the land, clearing the lot, arresting 11 people, and erecting a fence to safeguard the once again vacant lot for professional affordable housing developers. Had the city government not made use of its supposed title to the abandoned land, it no doubt could have made use of state and federal building codes to ensure that residents would be forced back into homelessness. For their own safety, of course. That is what, in fact, a county health commission in Indiana did to a 93-year-old man named Thelman Green, who lived in his 86 Chevrolet van, which the local towing company allowed him to keep on its lot. Many people thrown into poverty by a sudden financial catastrophe live out of a car for weeks or months until they get back on their feet. Living in a car is cramped, but it beats living on the streets. A car means a place you can have to yourself, which holds your possessions, with doors you can lock, and sometimes even air conditioning and heating. But staying in a car over the long term is much harder to manage without running afoul of the law. Thelman Green got by well enough in his van for 10 years, but when the Indianapolis Star printed a human interest story on him last December, the county health commission took notice and promptly ordered Green evicted from his own van in the name of the local housing code. Since government housing codes impose detailed requirements on the size, architecture, and building materials for new permanent housing, as well as on specialized and extremely expensive contract work for electricity, plumbing, and other luxuries, they effectively obstruct or destroy most efforts to create transitional, intermediate, or informal sorts of shelter that cost less than rented space in government-approved housing projects, but provide more safety and comfort than living on the street. Constraints on making a living. Turning from expenses to income, pervasive government regulation passed in the so-called public interest at the behest of comfortable middle and upper class progressives creates endless constraints on poor people's ability to earn a living or make needed money on the side. There are, to start out, the trades that the state has made entirely illegal. Selling drugs outside of a state-authorized pharmacy, prostitution outside of the occasional state-authorized brothel ranch, or running small-time gambling operations outside of a state-authorized corporate casino. These trades are often practiced by women and men facing desperate poverty. The state's efforts add the danger of fines, forfeitures, and lost years in prison. Beyond the government-created black market, there are also countless jobs that could be done above ground, but from which the poor are systematically shut out by arbitrary regulation and licensure requirements. In principle, many women in black communities could make money braiding hair with only their own craft, word of mouth, and the living room of an apartment. But in many states, anyone found braiding hair without having put down hundreds of dollars and days of her life to apply for a government-fabricated cosmetology or hair care license will be fined hundreds or thousands of dollars. In principle, anyone who knows how to cook can make money by laying out the cash for ingredients in some insulated containers and taking the food from his own kitchen to a stand set up on the sidewalk or, with the landlord's permission, in a parking lot. But then there are business licenses to pay for, often hundreds of dollars, and the costs of complying with health department regulations and inspections. The latter make it practically impossible to run a food-oriented business without buying or leasing property dedicated to preparing the food, at which point you may as well forget about it unless you already have a lot of startup capital sitting around. Every modern urban center has a tremendous demand for taxi cabs. In principle, anyone who needed to make some extra money could start a part-time gypsy cab service with a car she already has, a cell phone, and some word of mouth. She can make good money for honest labor, providing a useful service to willing customers as a single independent worker without needing to please a boss, who can set her own hours and put as much or as little into it as she wants in order to make the money she needs. But in the United States, city governments routinely impose massive constraints and controls on taxi service. The worst offenders are often the cities with the highest demand for cabs, like New York City, where the government enforces an arbitrary cap on the number of taxi cabs through a system of government-created licenses, or medallions. The total number of medallion taxis is capped at 13,000 cabs for the entire city, with the occasional government auctions for a handful of new medallions. The system requires anyone who wants to become an independent cab driver to purchase a medallion at monopoly prices from an existing holder or wait around for the city to auction off new ones. At the auction last November, a total of 63 new medallions were made available for auction, with a minimum bidding price of $189,000.
Besides the cost of a medallion, cab owners are also legally required to pay an annual licensing fee of $550 and to pay for three inspections by the city government each year at a total annual cost of $150. The city government enforces a single fare structure, enforces a common paint job, and now is even forcing all city cabs to upgrade to high cost, high tech GPS and payment systems, whether or not the cabbie or her customer happens to want them. The primary beneficiary of this politically imposed squeeze on independent cabbies is Verifone Holdings, the first firm approved to sell the electronic systems to a captive market. Doug Bergeron, Verifone's CEO, crows that every year we find a free ride on a new segment of the economy that is going electronic. In this case, Verifone is enjoying a free ride indeed. The practical consequence is that poor people who might otherwise be able to make money on their own are legally forced out of driving a taxi, or else forced to hire themselves out to an existing medallion holder on his own terms. Either way, poor people are shoved out of flexible, independent work, which many would be willing and able to do using one of the few capital goods that they already have on hand. Lots of poor people have cars they could use, not a lot have a couple hundred thousand dollars to spend on a government created license. Government regulation of land, housing, and labor creates and sustains the very structure of urban poverty. Government seizures create and reinforce the dilapidation of ghetto neighborhoods by constricting the housing market to a few landlords and keeping marginal lands out of use. Government regulations create homelessness and artificially make it worse for the homeless by driving up housing costs and by obstructing or destroying any intermediate informal living solutions between renting an apartment and living on the street. And having made the ghetto, government prohibitions keep poor people confined in it by shutting them out of more affluent neighborhoods where many might be able to live if only they were able to share expenses. Ratcheting costs up and opportunities down. Artificially limiting the alternative options for housing ratchets up the fixed costs of living for the urban poor. Artificially limiting the alternative options for independent work ratchets down the opportunities for increasing income. And the squeeze makes poor people dependent on, and thus vulnerable to negligent or unscrupulous treatment from, both landlords and bosses by constraining their ability to find other better homes or other better livelihoods. The same squeeze puts many more poor people into the position of living one paycheck away from homelessness and makes that position all the more precarious by harassing and coercing and imposing artificial destitution on those who do end up on the street. American state corporatism forcibly reshapes the world of work and business on the model of a commercial strip mall. Sanitized, centralized, regimented, officious, and dominated by a few powerful proprietors and their short list of favored partners, to whom everyone else relates as either an employee or a consumer. A truly free market, without the pervasive control of state licensure requirements, regulation, inspections, paperwork, taxes, fees, and the rest, has much more to do with the traditional image of a bazaar. Messy, decentralized, diverse, informal, flexible, pervaded by haggling, and kept together by the spontaneous order of countless small time independent operators, who quickly and easily shift between the roles of customer, merchant, contract laborer, and more. It is precisely because we have the strip mall rather than the bazaar that people living in poverty find themselves so often confined to ghettos, caught in precarious situations, and dependent on others, either on the bum or caught in jobs they hate but cannot leave, while barely keeping a barely tolerable roof over their heads. The poorer you are, the more you need access to informal and flexible alternatives, and the more you need opportunities to apply some creative hustling. When the state shuts that out, it shuts poor people into ghettoized poverty.